the total 24 hours of Spa, you rejoin us with just under three and a half hours of the race still to go. Ben Constanturus, John Watson, David Addison in now what's a warmer and sunnier Spa than it was at the beginning of the day. And still we have the lead battle developing between BMW and Audi. BMW 77, Lucas Lure at the wheel. Audi number one, Rene Rast, has just come into the pit lane. So that car number one down the pit road it's very much a two horse race and we've lost from the lead battle one of the Audis Audi number two has recently had an accident and has dropped way way down the order in the last hour of the race let's have a quick look back at how the race has developed thus far it began yesterday at half past four under sunny skies with a 61 strong grid waved away by Felix Baumgartner one last lap in order to get some warmth into the tyres before they went racing and away from the green lights, it was Lawrence Van Tour from pole position who bagged the advantage. Daniel Zampieri had an early spin and rotated out of contention. Nick Katzberg was just clipped by a hard-charging Stefan Mucker and went off the road. And then there was drama for the number eight Bentley after it had some steering damage after contact. Pierre Hershey spun, Marco Ciocci punctured, and the teams descended on cars early in the race. Bodywork was sorted out, punctures repaired. And on track, Audi took on Bentley in a real clash of the Titans. Kevin Astor had to pick the McLaren and sort out a fuse. Bodywork lay on the road. Nissans were punted into spins. The ART Grand Prix McLarens were charging up the order. And at the first round of pit stops, everybody was hard at work. Martin Raginger had a liquid leak and spun on the fluid. Out on track, Dirk Werner was trying to side his way through the traffic, but he was being pretty badly held up. And Bass Linders, the team principal, was not impressed. Dirk Werner held up for the best part of a lap behind Olivier Grutz in the Boots and Chignon McLaren. All Bass could do was bite his fingernails. Then the dramas came. Vakislav Maliv crashed heavily in the Ferrari. He was just avoided by Alexander Bunker. Then, as the race continued under the safety car, the field was released only for poor Tim Muller to have a big accident in the Von Rahn race in McLaren. Cue the safety car once again. Cue more pit stops as people elected to top up on fuel. Race restarted for just a few seconds before Carrie Moget went off the road. Cue the safety car again as his Boots and Gignon McLaren was out of the race. And Jürg Muller crashed 66 BMW into the back of Giacomo Piccini's Ferrari. The next restart didn't last long either. Andrew Danilov spun and was collected by Andrew Howard, whose Aston caught a blaze in a huge impact. And there was more to come as unsighted other drivers just thundered into the wreckage. Rene Ras drove number one Audi, and he was trying to work out why a green and yellow flag had been shown simultaneously. He lifted off to avoid any confusion. Steve Earle was tagged into a spin by the Team Parker Racing Audi. He dragged the Ferrari back to the pits despite the broken suspension. And Mark VDS patched up as best it could. The 66 BMW returned it to the pit apron as off the road went Alessandro Bonaccini in the black Ferrari and Alexei Vasiliev in the MRS run McLaren. Both rejoined. Then another accident. Vadim Kogai and Marcus Mai tangled in horrific fashion at Blanchimont. The race was suspended. The car stopped on the track in order for Marcus Mai to be airlifted to hospital. Number three Audi pitted under the red flag. Work was able to be done on the car, but the regulations say that if they were to do that, they would have to serve a drive-through penalty. The team then had to discuss whether or not it was worth doing any more work. What they did was wait for the safety car to move away to restart the race and then put the tyres on number three and get it ready to go back into the race. The drive-through penalty was served behind the safety car. Wrong, said the officials. They had to come in again in green flag race live conditions and therefore lost two minutes. Number three fell a place in the order. Above the track, the fireworks were putting on a great display. The drivers pounded their way down towards La Source as Christopher Mies on the inside of the hairpin served his drive-through. Went back on track. The Audi was spectacular at night time, sparks flying at the compression at Eau Rouge. For the fans though, there were more distractions. Freet, beer, fireworks, more freets, the disco, the funfair, the trade stalls, and maybe, just maybe, the chance of a bit of sleep before dawn broke over Spa. We started with 61 cars, 40 are still circulating, and in the early hours of the morning, the gentleman trophy leading Ferrari of Lorenzo Bontempelli lost a wheel. Marshall found the wheel nut. Bontempelli found the pit lane. The barbecues were lit, breakfast was served, and bleary-eyed fans emerged to see what was still going on in the race. Mark VDS down to just one BMW. 77 taking on this, number one Audi. Two Belgian teams, two different German cars.
as the teams caught up on a few missing Zeds. The drivers completed their next stint, and Rene Rast almost got his nose chopped off as he came up to lap Nigel Farmer in the Mercedes. A Hong Kong resident eventually gave him room. The next casualty was Claude Gosselin. He spun and headbutted the wall. He dragged the car back to the pit lane, but he lost time, and the Santelot mechanics were busy arguing with the marshals about whether cars were or weren't in a garage when work was done. Poor old RJN kept having uh, punctured tyres for the Nissan to sort out. The to and as far as the race leaders were concerned, they were getting through error free and drama free. 77 pitted Marcus Pauzel brought the car in. They did a disc pads change. The pendulum swung back the way of the number one Audi. Then more drama. Michael Meadows got caught up with Harold Primat down at the bus stop, and he had to pit to have the damage sorted out. And Ben Toar being the real drama. Number one did a pit stop and rejoined, and therefore 77 took over the lead as 35 had to limp back to the pit lane with a puncture. And with a loose floor, the Bentley mechanics were hard at work on number seven. Cedric Mezard slithered off into the gravel in his Ferrari, but he came out the other side. And then we had car number 18, Mercedes, with a punctured tyre as well. So it's all been happening. Thankfully, a lot of the anger, if you like, that the race contained early on with the wicked accidents, the vicious accidents that it was serving up have now disappeared and so we are looking at the battle between 77 and number one which is a Lucas Law BMW taking on number one Rene Rast and this is the drama that befell number two Audi just a few minutes ago diving up the inside at the source 63 came across contact served between the two and number two Audi has dropped to 13. So let's hear Vincent Voss team principals take on it with Ben Constanturis. Vincent Voss, we saw in the break there that uh, Benoit has had a small accident with the Mercedes. What was your take on it? Well, you know, this is a racing incident. Benoit was fighting for, for the podium and he was doing an incredible good job. Unfortunately, uh, he had uh, an incident. Well, this is what, what happened when you fight that tight at the end of a race of uh, yeah, 24 hours. So Benoit brought the car into the pits. Uh, it, it stayed in the box for quite a while. What were the problems? Yeah, 20 minutes to change a full corner. I think it was quite a great job from the guys. Uh, but OK, we are out of contention now for the podium. OK, strategy-wise then for, uh, for the car one, and obviously three is in contention as well a little bit. How many stops left for them? Well, you know, we are trying to extend as possible uh, our stint, but uh, it will be difficult to go, yeah, to go right to the end, and it will be difficult to fight with the BMW. Um, but, you know, we are, we are working hard and we are fighting hard and we will fight till the end. So three or four stops? The number of stops that we need to go to the end. OK, yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice try, Ben. Nice try. Uh, we'll try and do some number crunching up here. I reckon it's got to do three more. But if they can get away with two, then they're in the box seat. I think three. And I still think the BMW is going to be stronger at the end of the race. I think the last stop the Audi uh, will make will drop it back behind the BMW. But I'm happy to be proved wrong in this, as long as it's a great finish to the race. I think that on balance, your assessment is probably pretty accurate. And all that you can do in these situations, if you're slightly on the back foot, and Vincent Voss indicated that uh, they wouldn't disclose how many more pit stops they needed to do, they would do whatever it took. But you can, as I've been talking about through this morning session now until the, the final three hours and 21 minutes, you have the option of lifting and coasting into corners, which on the fuel definitely is a benefit. It also is a benefit if you are marginal, and we know that the Audis uh, certainly have had brake uh, caliper, or pad and disc changes. But in terms of your fuel, by lifting and coasting, that can make a contribution. And it does not necessarily mean you can't maintain a good pace. So right now we've got 77 BMW Lucas Lure in the lead from the number one Audi of Rene Rass and then Christopher Mies in number three in third place. 26 is the uh, Edward Sandstrom Audi, that is the Sandrock car. My choice for the top spot on the podium, but it's now two laps down. And then the first of the Mercedes, Maximilian Buch in fifth place, three laps down. And then you've got the first of the gentleman, the Pro-Am cars, the Ferrari 53, and that's a competitive battle. The next three places are all battling for the honours on the podium. And right now, it's as much a chance of saying, who's going to win that? Because we've got to see Alexander Sim go back in, and they've used Alexander Sim like a SIM card on a phone. It's never been taken out of the thing. <laughs> and it's a good tariff they're on with it. 
because he's really delivered, hasn't he? He has done a very good job indeed, Alexander Sims in 79. Now let's uh, have a look at where we're up to with BMW's strategy. They have now done, in number 77, 18 pit stops. Number one Audi has done 19 pit stops. There is going to be another BMW stop soon, but I still think they are going to be able to get away with one less, or at least uh, if, if you put that car through its last stop, it will be ahead of, it will be before the last stop for the number one Audi. I mean, all that BMW have to do, rather than what ID themselves need to do, is run at the pace of your of the cars that are chasing you. And the BMW has got sufficient pace, particularly when it's in clear air. It does suffer a little bit, maybe more than the ID does in traffic. But all they've got to do is match the pace of the IDs and the advantage that they have in terms of pit stops and the number of pit stops and when they fall, they don't need to do an awful lot more. When Vincent Voss was talking about the need to get to the end, I think that end is, is going to be sort of on pure race pace. They're going to miss out by about 10 minutes because if a safety car might save them now in terms of fuel, if it's a long-ish one, but the calculations looking at it, they cut that they are 10 minutes away from being able to do this on two stops. They'll have to do three more. Yeah, I mean, it's going to trip them up. Great if you can organize a safety car to come in at a convenient time to suit your strategy. But those events are unlikely to occur. But at any time in the remaining three hours, 18 minutes and 20 odd seconds, there's no reason to believe we won't have a final safety car intervention. It yeah. is so unpredictable. Although we've gone through that very unpleasant phase, the first six hours of this race, uh, and you, I think, concur with my views on the aggression that we saw all through the field. Everything is now settled down, everybody's bedded in, and of course, in this last quarter, and almost halfway through the final quarter, people are looking to the end, consolidating, with the exception here of the second place ID, Rene Rask, they're going to have to push. But in the process of pushing, you can save a little bit of fuel. Let's find out what BMW's strategy is going to be on this. Ben has managed to find Bass Linders down in the pit lane. We've got some very intelligent people in the TV compound suggesting that you are in the box seat strategy-wise to win this. How many pit stops you got left? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> no, we have the same pit stop, uh, I think, as uh, WRT. So it will be very tight. That's why every, every second counts. So um, we have to try to maximize uh, all our time on track. Do you think you have uh, two stops left? Yeah, well, I think our last stop is a little bit shorter, but not by much. So, uh, but they have a bit more speed. You know, their car is a little bit quicker than ours. So uh, it's going to be difficult. But it must be nice not having to do any fuel saving for the drivers. They can just go out as fast as possible without fuel saving. Well, yeah, of course, uh, for the drivers, it's nice to do that, you know, to go full until the end. Uh, it's a lot of pressure, so, but uh, it's fun at the same time. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not entirely sure what Ben is being given the whole truth and nothing but the truth by either Bass or Vincent there, because they're both, understandably, playing cards close to chest. They're not giving anything away. They're not looking confident. And both, I think, are playing down their chances. Well, I think what is clear is right now the BMW is in the lead and work based on, on your calculations, David, the window or the pit stop likelihoods for the BMW and the Audi, they, they're not overlapping, they're almost diametrically opposite in terms of where they are in the sectors. So we, we believe, principally, you are very persuaded that they are in the strongest position. And my view is that now in the lead, and bearing in mind there's going to be another overlap when the BMW will make it stop and then the ID, principally the number one ID, will get back into the lead of the race. The third place ID is one lap down, so it's almost out of it altogether. With some catastrophe on track, as we saw last night, where when cars would be in a line of uh, either a train of safety cars or even worse, another red flag situation. That's the level of assistance that now that anybody outside second place is going to need to put a challenge on the car we're just seeing the back end of going through and exiting the Paul Freire Corp. Now this is Lucas Lure in the car, who can't yet find a way through the traffic, even though the pat marker is trying to indicate to get out of the way, and then he moves across a little bit, tries to get the apex from the corner. That is the 49 Ferrari, Jean-Marc at the wheel, now it gets out of the way, so that 
has been a scrappy lap ready for Lucas Law. He was being caught in sector one and sector two because of the traffic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the ebb and flow of this traffic situation is always going to catch yeah. you somewhere. I mean, you will benefit from it through a series of laps, catching and overtaking back markers, then other occasions, you'll be penalised. You, you can't really always have clean, plain sailing, but you can manage it. And part of that management is ensuring that you use the strengths of your car to try and put yourself into the right position at the right part of track where your car's at the strongest. And that's where the thinking driver is capable of maximizing the potential of a car that may not have straight line speed that some of the competitors have, it's got lap time and uh, it's got other benefits around other parts of the track. So play to your strengths and don't let yourself get suckered into losing your momentum behind a slower car. It's One of the things that uh, out, uh, the BMW seem to be very concerned of, and Baz Linders especially, is the amount of Audis on circuit and the amount of Audis around him on circuit as well. Remember, each of the leading Audi cars, whether they're pro or pro-am, do have an Audi professional driver in them and Baz Linders, and therefore they will all be gunning, regardless of if they're 10th or 1st, for an Audi win. Baz Linders is aware of that, he doesn't have much support and backup in terms of cars on track for BMW, and therefore he's frantically pacing and calling people to try and say, please stay out of our way because we need to push, push, push. So there might be some Audi blockers unofficially, is that what we're suggesting? I wouldn't suggest that, but we, <laughs> we, did, we did see that car pretty hard to get past, right? Uh, yeah, funny that, wasn't it? Yeah. So, numerically, you're absolutely right, there are far more Audis than BMWs, and I think this is one of the reasons why the Mark VDS team has this good following, not just in Belgium, but in GT racing generally, because it is really an underdog team, and it's been through the travails, yes, it's had good results, and every year it comes to Spa and something seems to go wrong. I saw Maxime Martin a few minutes ago, and he just shrugged and said, yeah, another year gone, but one day his victory here will come, but maybe this is for the team, at least, the year that Mark VDS can do it. There is a vast amount of support and we are now, what, three hours, 12 minutes away. The car is in the hunt for a victory. And where's the next BMW? You've got to go a hugely long way down the order. It's down to seventh place, yeah. To the Alexander Sim car, which is, of course, running That's a right. Pro-Am. Yeah. And they're not really interested, per se, in the battle for the lead. And maybe they could assist. But personally, I would be very surprised if anyone in the RD team suggested applying blocking manoeuvres. It would be very clearly obvious and uh, in that case, I think the team that was responsible would be coming to disrepute, and, and therefore... So... Now the leaders go through, and the gap is coming down and down and down. It is 4.6 seconds. There is the number one Audi. So normally we'd be talking about the lead trading on pit stops. This really, for the first time in many, many hours, is building up to a genuine fight on the track. So if the lead changes on the circuit and the Audi starts to build up an advantage, that's going to help it in terms of pit stops. I mean, at one point, just before we had that midday break, the second place Audi, when they were both on track, was about 40 seconds behind. Mm. Where has that 40-odd seconds evaporated to? You couldn't do it in an hour. No, not, not judging by the information we're seeing on screen, so both cars are lapping depending on traffic in the middle, in some cases, low minute, one or two minute 22s. The last lap for Lucas Lohr was a 23.7. Again, traffic related. Rennie Rast is driving the wheels of that oh, car, yeah. currently in second place, 4.6 seconds. Behind there, you can see four, three laps, one and a half seconds, 2.2 seconds, 1.6. That's not pace, that's traffic related. Now, is the BMW backing off to try to get away with only doing two stops. Fuel, not really the issue, it's down to driver time because 65 minutes is a stint. But they've still got to manage all of this and get to the end, so we need to try and factor this in as well if we can. But still, I think the BMW is... It's going to be very, very close given the way the Audi is now going, but I still think the BMW is slightly bit stronger. But let's see, we have got the team manager of car 63 being summoned to the stewards. This is the Adam Christodoulou, Yelma Berman, Mike Parisi car. That was the incident, I think, that we might... I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. We did see a replay of the incident with uh, uh, Patrillier when they yep. had that collision, and that looked to be a fairly aggressive form of defence on a car that was feathered on the field uh, as against a car that was competing or battling in the top three. So th there may have been uh, some issues with that, but maybe something entirely different. 
So we'll see what pans out from that, as with a flash of the lights, Rene Rast, who has won, of course, the Spa 24 Hours, turns his way now up through the bus stop and makes his way towards the timing line. So the Audi getting a little bit closer in the first sector and in the second sector will come across the timing line. Ooh. It is now in traffic and the gap is down to 2.8 seconds. Well, he's taken a bunch of time on that last lap. He's taken almost 1.6 seconds out of the leading BMW and Lucas Lure sitting there, his last lap at 23. Rennie Rast, last lap across the line at 21.7. Two minutes, 21 points up. There is genuine pace in this Audi hounding down the BMW. And uh, he's almost now within vapor. The, the, whatever comes out of the exhaust of a modern racing car these days isn't the kind of Castrolar fumes that we have known of days of yore. But he's that close, he can now almost smell it. Let Luke see it. Turning his way through Le Combe then. So the lead battle with just over three hours to go. Just over one normal Blanc Pan Endurance Series race distance, isn't it? Three hours coming yeah. down now to Bruxelles. There you've got the two lead cars in shot. And Rene Rast hunting down Lucas Law, whose last lap was a 2.23. Partly that was traffic, but bear in mind that Audi throwing caution to the wind here because if number one were to go off or have a problem, number three is in third place and that can then try and step up to the plate. It's a lap down, but it could just get back into the equation. And what was really frustrating for BMW is that as soon as René Rast vacates the seat, we've got Lawrence Van Thor to fill it, and then Marcus Winkelhock just to top it all off. So the car's always going to be quick, in other yep. words, isn't it? Lucas Lohr, very quick, we know that. Dirk Werner, very quick, we know that. Marcus Paltela is certainly not a slow driver. He knows this car inside out. He knows Spa inside out. He's done so many miles around here over the years. Yeah, but uh, in terms of car strength, this is the car of the two that we're interested in right now that has got the strongest driver lineup without hesitation. So out of campus they come, past the college on the inside of the track there. You've got the cart track to the right and the overflow paddock and then you go left through the Cour Paul Frere. And so on this lap, 451. The lead battle is well and truly joined, isn't it? As you can see, the Audi creeping up onto the back of the BMW now. Sector one, it was faster by seven tenths. Sector two, faster by four tenths. Out of the bus stop, the chicane with the pit lane, entry lane behind, and then over the timing line comes BMW, comes Audi. One second between them. I will be curious to see what Lucas Lure does if he tries to be very defensive later in the brakes into the source back end of the car just step sideways momentarily. I wonder, is he going to be defensive in his defense, or is he going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight you. You've got the pace. You're going to take me and pass me on pace. And it's going to happen coming up the hill over the radio and on the run up to Le Coombe. Look at the speed that the Audi carries. And the BMW is a sitting duck, in effect, for that straight line speed of the Audi. So here they come, lead battle, nose to tail, heading up now towards Le Combe. The Audi pulls to the outside, Lucas Law doesn't really fight the faster car there. Okay. Sits back in behind, but there's yeah. no point being silly about it. No, no absolutely. I mean, I, I, that was what I saw before the overtake. And I think that Lucas Law is feeling that, you know, we're going to play a game. We've got a, a strategy, we're going to stick to it. We're not going to sucker for getting into a door handle rub or a hip and shoulder bang <laughs> somewhere around the racetrack. So... Lucas Lure has conceded the place. It was an easy overtake. A well executed pass by Rene Rast. He got it all right from La Source, all the way down the hill, up through Eau Rouge, over Radio, and, you know, textbook overtake. The leaders are turning their way through Pouin. Let's try and catch up if we can with Dirk Van, because he, I think, will be next into number 77. And before he gets his helmet on, he can talk to Ben Constanturis. Dirk, just getting ready to get into the car. Uh, no real worry, despite the fact you just lost the uh, lead. Why is that? Yeah, we just cannot quite go the pace. We need to to keep the Audi behind. And uh, for us, I think it's now to survive the race and see where we can end up. Um, but you're on for a double stint, right? I don't know yet. I don't know. I have to talk to the engineers what they want to do. And so after this stop, you'll get in the car, there with one more stop and then the check of flag. Yeah, we still have three hours, so it's uh, three more stints. So uh, when we do single stints, three drivers have to drive. If we do a double and a single, we have to see. But I, I don't do a triple stint. OK, thank you. Thank you. Three more stints is two more stops, of course. So there'll be this one and then one more stint and then you should be able to get to the checkered flag. We hope. 
over the timing line goes the BMW, now second back from the number one uh, Audi, turning its way through La Source. So the car traditionally has come in after the hour, so this is the BMW we're talking about, so it's got a few more minutes yet before it needs to make its pit stop. Yes, and uh, Derek Verner not really ready to get into that car, so it's unlikely that it's going to come in this lap. Yeah. Normally you give a driver certainly minimum of a lap, probably more likely two laps, warning to make sure that he is fully prepared and got the earplugs in comfortably and helmet, balaclava, gloves, and you want to do that in your time, not under the stress of knowing the car is coming in. And, well, there's another little issue where Ferrari cooperates and pulls, stays on the left-hand side, so no problem for Rennie Rast. As Dirk Muller looks, he's not on the, he's, uh, Dirk is on the pit lane, he's not getting into the car, certainly this lap, that's uh, Downhill goes Rene Rast, then the new race leader. Working lap 453 here at Spa now. One second to the good over Lucas Lure, who is shadowing him, and by the sound of it, running to a pace. But the Audi has got to push on if this car is behind on pit stops. They need to overcome that deficit because uh, a full pit stop is 112 seconds. So if they've got to have one extra stop over the BMW, then you can see why they've got to really throw caution to the wind here and push on. That's a different deal for Rene Rast and for this particular car. So he's going to just simply drive the wheels over and do what he can do. And if they get beaten on the efficiency and the strategy from BMW, so be it they can say we did everything that was possible within our control to take this victory. But it's still three hours. This is the length of a normal Blancpain Enduro event. There's the car that is that the car that is leading it is? That's the lead car of the, the Pro-Am, the, the, the two Ferraris. John, just uh, thinking about the strategy, and uh, yes, they potentially can do one less pit stop, but there is uh, that last lap, the uh, Audi was two seconds a lap faster, and the, the gap for the, the time it takes to do a pit stop is just under two minutes. So. With two seconds per lap, we've still got three hours going, which is uh, a good amount of laps. Surely they can win this actually on pace alone without this strategy. Well, I mean, that's a question of you have to make a judgment on what's going to happen. And I think that those two seconds were partly due to uh, the traffic that Lucas Lure had to get us find his way around. It's a, it's, a, it's a long game. BMW are going to play a long game. Audi's game is very clear. They've just got to go as hard as they can and try and ensure that they get themselves into a position where when we get to the last round of pit stops, they're not caught back-footed or wrong-footed. So as you look at the Pro-Am Cup standings, the car's making their way to Les Combes. And what have we got at the moment? The class being led still by Ferrari because Marco Ciocci has uh, got into the lead of the class ahead of Ollie Bryant. And then uh, Andrea Piccini still at the wheel of 52. There's your Pro-Am second place car, Oli Bryant it is at the wheel, coming now down through uh, Eau Rouge, turning his way once more up to Les Combes, and the Curie Cos run BMW is now with the uh, historic racer at the wheel. In fact, we've just had that lead change because now Ciocci, yes, is, is ahead of Oli Bryant, who's busy working his way through traffic, so second in Pro-Am is the uh, Barwell run car, and then for third in the class, Piccini in the Ferrari. Yeah, so I was all going on, <laughs> both in the commentary booth and just getting information and suggestions that some of the cars in this battle for the lead may well be facing problems that they're not owning up to, and obviously they don't want to, and that might be part of the reason that we're seeing a loss of pace from the second place BMW, to be confirmed from the pit lane, but uh, it might be that they have an issue which, they, if they wanted to rectify, would mean a pit stop. So as the Curia Cost car works its way towards the timing line, this is the one that's third in Pro-Am. You're looking at the Skippy Ferrari, Andrea Piccini, is the man behind the wheel of the car that, at some point, we are convinced Craig Lowndes has, has been near, at least. Yes, well, I saw Craig was coming back up to the, the commentary booth and asked him and said, what's going on? I mean, we've been waiting to see you in this car. And he said, well, you know, uh, 
And I said, are you going to be? He's in the cylinders overalls. Are you yeah. getting back in again? And I thought the feeling he gave me was that it's unlikely. And I sense there's a disappointment. Now, obviously, a team's got to, in the case, there are the, the second place. No, the first place, one leading the category, the, the Pro-Am category. They want to use the talent that they've got to its most efficient. And if they've got three of the four drivers that are performing better than the fourth driver, then they're going to focus on those three drivers. But it would be a big surprise to me if that that was the case. Mm. You would want to do another stint. And of course, they've also got to factor in the maximum driving time available for the others and the minimum available that he has to do under the regulations as well. So there's some juggling to be done here. Yeah, the impression I got was he didn't think he was going to be back in the car. Okay. Shame that, but uh, yeah. he's certainly been an asset to the event. Come back again, Craig. And, he, and I think, I mean, I asked him what about the future, you know, and I think that it's very clear that uh, there would be an opportunity he would take it. He would like yeah. to do some more endurance racing. And these cars, you know, quite a different vehicle to the Aussie V8s that he races back home and, and some of the international events that they go to. It's been an experience. It's been, uh, you know, a toe in the water yeah. to get a feel for it. And you know, coming from a car which is a very, very manually sort of controlled car in the Aussie V8s to a very much more sophisticated European GT car, they're quite different. Mm. And it, you just don't switch off and switch on uh, immediately, particularly on a long circuit and a, a track like Spa with all the uh, subtleties and, and, and you know, fundamentally difficult areas on the racetrack. And of course, bear in mind that within this team are people that live and breathe Ferrari 458, real specialists. That they're always going to be that little bit quicker, and Craig's got to measure himself against them. He can't expect to just walk in and be absolutely on their pace. Well, the, the things such as ABS, which is something that everybody would, in a road car today accepts as being a normal feature in the car. Traction control, maybe something you'd get more on a high-performance range of cars. But understanding those two issues and being able to make use of them and benefiting from them as opposed to never having really experienced them and then having to learn what the benefits are and having to work around it. Great shot of the Bentleys yeah, there running together. What a great photograph that yeah. would be. <laughs> and it's seven ahead of eight. Up the inside, seven is Stephen Kane, eight is Duncan Tappy. They are two laps apart with seven ahead, not only on the track, but also in the classification. So Bentley coming up over the line. Poor old number eight really has had the ropey luck this year, but I'm sure it's going to change before the end of the season. Nürburgring, the last round of the Blancpain Endurance Series, as up the inside goes Stephen Kane, who said early on in the race, we're going to get this car home, even if it's on three wheels. Well, I think they're happy with the fundamental reliability of the car. They've just got issues in the opening laps with the number eight car, particularly. It's still not entirely clear how the steering rack got damaged, but it has to be a contact from another car, uh, and a very unusual problem to have to have to deal with. And then Stephen Kane also in one of the safety car interventions prior to the safety car intervention going through the, the carnage up at the top of Radio, somehow rather debris severed a brake hose. You can't make that up. Exactly, exactly. What did they do? A 30-hour test or something pre-event and yet that's the little thing you can never legislate for. Well, it's easy doing a 30-hour test because you're the only car on the track. Exactly. You're not having 60 other cars and, uh, and the kind of, you know, six hours of the opening part of this race that we saw, which was I mean, just not quite shell shocking, but pretty bad. Back on board with Stephen Kane. John Talker's round a bit of the lap. And Stephen's coming down to pool. Let's listen to see. Yeah, obviously, it has to lift on the entry. I don't know whether there was a much of a brake, but it was just a little dab of the left foot onto the brake. Then let the car run way wide on the exit as we see the number two car in the pits. And this is a driver change. Frulier's got out. Then we go back on board with Stephen Kane. Out of the Fania chicane's then down to this campus, part one, part two. Always a corner falls away from you, a tendency for the car to run out wide. You catch the curb, then coming back again and accelerating all the way through. And if you can go flat through the second part of campus, that's a big advantage because it gives you the run, the beginning of the run for this whole section, which is pretty much climbing all the way, it sort of levels out a little bit as you enter the first part of, uh, of Blanchemont, then the second part, and then clearly is climbing uphill all the way up to the bus stop chicane, and just get a pick your apex and turn the car in.
get off the brakes early, let the wheels, front wheels do their job. The car looks perfect. I mean, the exit coming out of the bust of the car looks as good as anything else out there. Mm. Stephen Kane's last lap, 2.22.8. He's running quicker than Lucas Lure in second place. He's running quicker than the lead uh, Pro-Am Ferrari. I mean, Stephen is doing what we've seen him do. Yeah. Silverstone, particularly at, at Paul Rica, dragging a performance in the closing stages of this race. Just under three hours to go. Whether he can catch and overtake the number two Audi of, of what's just now in the pit stop, anyway. Nice the number three car in as well. So there is three, which is Christopher Meese car that's uh, just come in. Christopher Meese and Frank Stippler have done the lion's share of the driving in this car. And away it goes. New tyres on. Down the pit road. And a round of applause you could hear in the background. So the mechanics very pleased with their efforts. Motivating one another by uh, congratulating each other on a job well done. Was that the 26 Audi going out just ahead of it? Or I couldn't quite pick up the the but tail light. Not sure. There was something whitish. Yeah. Which would be the colour of the Santa Lock car, but if it was, that would have been an even better stop for Santa Lock. Oh, back end slightly steps out for Stephen Kane, but very quickly catches it and uh, lets us in again. Just having to wait until you get that feel of through the steering wheel, through your feet, through your body that the car is there. It's always that point of entry into Pujol where if you haven't got the massive load of downforce that other, gener other forms of motorsport can generate, you've just got to wait. Is that a... Uh, no, it's not right. I thought the right rear looked a bit... That seems to be okay. Gentlemen, trophy class leading Ferrari. This is Peter Mann at the wheel of it. The car is in 25th place. The AF Corsa Ferrari in the Gentleman Trophy. Peter Mann, Alexander Tuckin, it's a senior. Francisco Guedes and Cedric Meza. And it's had a very good run. It's had the odd trip through the gravel, but by and large, he says tempting fate, uh, this car has gone very strongly indeed. Well, you could see visually the pace of the car through Eau Rouge and Radio is, let's say, slower than yeah. the very quickest. But, you know, a gentleman car like this, it's, it's not here to be the quickest through Eau Rouge and Radio. It's here to try and achieve a podium in its category and principally to finish this 24-hour race. You talk about gentlemen drivers and you've heard in the interviews over the course of the race the pros making reference to the gentlemen. These are not hopeless people. These are drivers that national level, club level racing have achieved quite a lot or in historics they step up to this form of racing and the gentleman trophy exists to give them something to aim for but in their own right at their own level they are solid drivers and yes okay there are going to be occasions where they wander into the path of a quicker car but Julian Westwood, for example, is certainly not, if you like, one of the uh, amateur gentleman racers. Julian himself, in his youth, was a Formula 3 racer, a career saloon car driver. These days he works with Team Parker Racing as a driver coach and uh, helps with the logistics of the team. So Julian is somebody who's uh, graded such because of his uh, results in the past as Bass Linders dashes into the Mark VDS garage. That looks a bit urgent. It was extremely urgent. I don't know what the problem is, but certainly, and let me just see... Uh, Dirk Werner getting his helmet on, but very exercised indeed. I've never seen Baz move that quickly uh, in all my years of knowing him, to be honest. But no, he's, he, he normally moves far more stealthily than that. There is 77 Dirk, uh, sorry, now Lucas Lohr uh, working his way through. Dirk Werner is going to take the car over as we've been hearing. And I just wonder, is this suddenly a late call from Lucas Lohr uh, saying, I'm coming in this lap, and we saw Dirk Werner in the back of the garage putting his helmet on, so maybe that is the reason why we saw Baz Linders sprint across the pit lane. There is Werner with the helmet getting the all the, the bits that a driver has, the radio attachments, the drinks bottle attachments, putting his gloves on now, and uh, the Lucas Lure BMW within about 25 or so seconds is going to be driving down the pit lane, and uh, a driving change is going to take place. Howard Blank, you're looking at third in the gentleman trophy and I think from what I'm hearing from the pit lane that Bass Linders was concerned to know where Dirk Werner had gone to but I think all is well we know where he is he's at the back of the garage getting togged up but I think Baz was just being very keen well uh, to go and find him yeah yeah no but I think the reason he was key was because there may be if we wait to see whether Lucas Lure has come into the pits or not we think he has gone past but uh, when you see the team principal as exercised as that there is a sound reason and it's not because Lucas Lowe is not coming in, it's because there's a very strong indication he might be coming in and they want their driver, their relief driver, to be fully 
ready to step into that car. The driver that they thought was going to get into the car was being interviewed by somebody else, and that's why they couldn't find him. This is what I'm being told by the team on Sky, but let's go and find out a bit more, because Ben Consiguris may be able to shed more on this. Uh, yeah, interesting one. Dirk Werner ready to get in the car, all helmeted up, but Baz Linders ran off to go and get Marcus Paltola, who seemed a bit confused because he's not due to drive, but now is getting ready. So both cars, uh, sorry, both drivers are ready to jump into just one car. OK, and I gather as Baz was looking for Marcus Paltola, he was off doing an interview for somebody else. That's exactly, why he was, he was in the media centre, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> the obvious place to find your driver, isn't it, Ben? So I wonder what, well, unless this is to get Marcus Paltola's last stint and then put Dirk Werner in at the very end, I mean, certainly Derek Werner will be maybe the quicker of the, the two options. And I just I thought I caught a glimpse of, if you look in the ID garage, um, those dolly jacks mm. outside the BMW garage. I wonder, is that going to see the car being spun around and pushed into the garage to do whatever they want to do, rather than just simply doing a driver change, refuel and tyre? I'm reliably informed by the team whose PR department is uh, Skyping away, that it's not a car issue. So let's take them at their word for the moment. That's what we wanted to hear. Thank you very much, team. Scurrilous rumours, which of course <laughs> motorsport has lived on all its entire you, existence. You don't say. Right, Ben has got more news. Uh, the things that you thought were jacks were actually the, where they put the wheels in. So they hold the wheels from rolling away in the pit lane. That's what they sort of look like jacks, slightly uh, concave uh, pieces of metal. And they'll hold the wheels for the pit stop. And they're getting ready for the pit stop. They have two drivers helmeted up. But Dirk Werner is now taking off his helmet. So it looks like Marcus Paltola okay. will take the next stint. And the car's going to go over the timing line. That will do 4.59 laps. I'm thinking it should be in on that 4.61. So it's got one lap. Possibly two laps to be on schedule before the pit stop, Ben. And this car has fallen now nine seconds behind the race leader, René Rast. So Rast has been consistently in the middle, Lou, 2 minutes 22. The last lap for Lucas Lure, 23.9. And the time is just simply a bit like a sand timer ebbing away. And the longer you look at it, the quicker the time seems to pass. So Bas Linders has done his athletics, he's found his drivers, he's got them where he needs them to be. And when the car comes in, let's find out if it's purely going to be a routine stop. Or whether Skype is about to elicit more information from Mark VDS from the pit lane. There's the team, they're ready. It's, it's surprising that, that Marcus Peltola would be in the media centre giving an interview. I mean, why not just simply have the interview done in the garage? Why not do it? I mean, to get from the garage to the press room is a bit of a stretch, depending where you are in the pit lane. So, all a bit stressful in these closing and, and, hours. And needlessly so. So, 77, due a pit stop, either this lap or if it's keeping on its 27 lap schedule, the next one comes now through Coulomb. So, you think we're going to see Marcus Peltola in for a single stint and then a double stint at the end by Dirk Werner. That's my thinking, because Dirk is slightly the quicker, and therefore you never know what might happen at the very end. You need your quickest man in at the end, just in case. And you need to get Peltola in to get the others into the, the right amount of zone from the their driving period. Exactly, yeah. and, you, and you can't have one driver doing over an allotted time, and you can't have one driver doing more than... Uh, what is it, three hours, 15 minutes in one hit, and so you've got to stagger that. So, yeah, get Paltola done, and then, I'm guessing when I say this is how it's going to pan out, I'll wait to be corrected, but put Dirk Werner in for the double stint at the very end, because you know how fast he is. Yeah. Kind of makes sense in my head. No, I think it's, I think it's <laughs> eminently sensible, and I'm sure that uh, that will be relayed to the team via all the mechanisms that teams, you know, they don't just sit and look at the pictures, they do have people listening to the content, and sometimes content can throw up solutions to problems because we're not directly involved we can see it from a, an overview position so as the 77 BMW has gone across the line it has now done 460 laps so it is on target if it pits this time to do uh, another 27 lap stint which is what the team is working to so 461 is where the car hopefully can go for the next pit stop and that last lap from Lucas Lure, 2.25. Contrast the lap time of Stefano Telli in fourth place to a 
Ben, more news? Yeah, interesting you say 27 laps for BMW. When I was in the WRT uh, garage for Audi, they, they have all their strategies on the back wall and they, on the, an Excel spreadsheet that they can adapt. They're aiming for 26 laps, so they're doing one lap less. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? I think that's something we picked up early in the race, that they didn't go quite as far. Certainly 66, I feel, didn't go as far on its early stints as 77. It's academic now, because that's the surviving car. But yeah, the BMW is doing 27. And maybe, because it's at a slightly reduced pace now, that is helping it to achieve such. But it's definitely going to be worth having a word, Ben, if you can, with Lucas Lure when he gets out of the car, just to see whether everything is 100% with that BMW. You get all of these rumours, as John mentioned a few minutes ago, and some of the rumours won't go away, that there is a small I issue mean, with the car. I mean, the question I would like to ask, and Ben may be able to do this in the, in the pit lane, is... Yeah, what we're seeing is this a case of lift and coast. In other words, are they deliberately reducing their pace in the belief that the pace that Audi is running at, they're burning up a lot more fuel, and therefore that's going to, at the end of the day, when everything sort of nets out, that that will work to the efficiency and the thoughtfulness of what BMW have tried to achieve. It's all ifs, ands, or buts. So this is the number one Audi that leads the way, heading up then to the bus stop with two and three quarters Ooh, to go, the car off just ahead. It's a BMW. And it's going to reverse out of the way. It's one of the Royal, it's the Royal Motorsport car, I think, 43, which is the Roberto Ravaglia team car. And it's been in the gravel once when Eugenio Amos threw it off earlier in the race. Here comes the replay, up to the bus stop, and... This is a, a, a failure. Oh, no, maybe. Uh, is that a failure or was that a... Certainly, it was very unusual. The car, all of a sudden, under braking, took a turn to the left. May have possibly had a one of the wheels on the left-hand side. And it's difficult just to that very quick to have to look at it again and see it. But certainly, something caused the car to veer quite sharply to the left. And uh, that then set off that whole sequence of yeah. spinning up to the barrier without actually hitting it. Right, in has come 77, 461 laps done, so it's on its schedule. Driver change, Marcus Palfeller to take over. Lucas Lure is the man who's got out, helped strap in his teammate, his co-driver. And Stefano Comandini, after his dramas, has brought the Royal Motorsport car in as well. Door closed, yep. So, fuel and then a new set of boots. A very grimy car now, isn't it, after the rigours of 20-odd hours? Yeah, and it's been uh, a tough race. Uh, there's not been any rain of any consequence, so that's one blessing so far. Looking skyward, there is quite a lot of high cloud, and uh, that, it, I think, of course, going to be sufficiently high that's going to pass by without visiting the circuit. So, get the thing fired up. Uh, Marcus Peltala makes his way down towards the pit lane and then the swing around the inside of La Source and then all the way down the other side of the pit complex. So I reckon that BMW's got to do one more stop and the Audi has to make two. So that, See whether that pans out that way. So you're suggesting that with two minutes 41, the next time the BMW comes into the pits, it'll be at one minute 41-ish. I don't think uh, it can do it. It can't do. It's not going to do a one hour 41 stint and one tank of fuel and one set of tyres. No, you're quite right. So it's got one extra. Over the timing line comes number one Audi. And two stops BMW, three stops Audi, I think, is what we're going to have to recalculate it to. So. 2 hours and 41 to go. There is still something, as I say, floating around Mark VDS, which Ben has got to get to the bottom of. Because there are one or two concerned faces, but that Audi is absolutely flying, isn't oh, it? I mean, it is in a different planet to anybody else on the radio. I mean, Rennie Rass has driven one of the best stints of anybody in a GT car I've seen in a very, very long time. He has literally just grabbed that car and dragged the time. Now, Lucas Law just got out of the car. He knows how it is performing. Let's hear from him with Ben. I thought I'd come and sit down with you, Lucas, because uh, that must have been a very tough stint. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not easy. 
But it's, uh, it's never easy, it's not easy for anybody. We have a slight problem with our ABS. So it doesn't work so well, so you have to push the brake quite hard. And uh, without ABS you have to take care about lockups. So uh, it's tough right now. Um, we, we cannot go to speed from the Audi. Maybe we, we have something in our backhand on the strategy side. But it's, uh, for the moment it's important to keep as close as possible. And then we see at the end it's still two and a half hours to go, two hours, 40 minutes, so still can happen a lot. Is that the explanation for the full two seconds loss in pace, or are you trying to also save a bit of fuel? No, no. I mean, if you have a car which is supposed to run with ABS and then uh, we have a problem with the ABS, for sure that doesn't help. Well, then you incredibly good job from you, Lucas. Thanks. So well, ABS, he tells us. Yep, I mean, the car is designed to run with ABS. All the setup on the car is focused around that. I don't know. Well, in theory, I thought you were able to turn the ABS, turn ABS off. Mm. Uh, but of course, it's the whole thing is the, the, the pedal feel and the whole basis of how ABS operates. And then you're going to, it's a bit like maybe driving a car with power steering and the power steering fails. That's probably the nearest analogy that you could make. It suddenly changed the steering weight substantially and also as a bearing on, on the feedback in the feel. So what he's getting through his foot on the brake is totally new information and not necessarily information that's helping him. And so now, with that recent pit stop for 77, it has virtually lost a lap. There it is, look, with number one Audi right up behind. So not only has the lead changed, but now with the cars running as they are, with track position as well as pit stop sequence, 77 in the hands of Marcus Paltola is in danger of going a lap down. But we are still convinced that the Audi needs to make one stop more than does the BMW. But this is where the strategy could play out. Frank Stippler right behind the BMW up the straight. It's got more speed. He can pull out, get alongside, take the corner away from the BMW. And you know, having these two cars running at a faster pace. So that puts Rene Rass, yeah. the race leader, a lap up. But of course, once we get to the next pit stop, so the BMW will go back onto that lap. Now, if the Audi has got to make one extra stop, that means it's got to lose another 90 seconds, 60 for the drive-through bit. And even if they double stint tyres, then at least 30 seconds on top of that for the fuel. So that BMW now looks a lot more vulnerable, doesn't yeah. it? Because it's lost a lap, which is 2 minutes 20. That's a heck of a lot more than the 90 seconds. It is. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to risk double stinting at this period in the race. They're going to want the most grip they can get. They've got to depend on the grip to get the performance. I don't think they're going to be doing, going down that route of time saving with not changing your tyres against time gained by running fresh tyres. So out of the pith path they go and you can see the pace of the Audi as it pulls away. And with this being a circuit where you've got to use the brakes a heck of a lot, you can understand exactly why Lucas Law was concerned with his ABS problem. So he's had a tough stint. I mean, the lap times that he was doing were still pretty good, even allowing for that ABS problem, but just not as good as the number one Audi. Well, the, the effect that Lucas Law will be dealing with is because he has lost something which he's been reliant upon. In my view, what he will be doing is coming to a corner and being a little bit more apprehensive getting on the brake, not coming up and being committed because he doesn't know if he's going to have a brake pedal or a brake that's going to slow him down. Now, is that another reason why they put Marcus Paltola into the car? Because he knows the Z4 a bit better than the other two and perhaps can do a better job of driving around that problem? Certainly, Paltola knows the car better than Lucas Lua does, uh, but I think the way they're running it is just they've got to put Paltola in because of the, the way the driver uh, pairings that have been worked through uh, but what does drive through penalty is that for? Car 63, the uh, Yama Berman, Mike Parisi and Adam Christodoulou Mercedes for causing this collision against Audi number two. Remember a while ago we said the team manager was going to the stewards? Well, yeah. that is the outcome. Yeah. And one would probably think it's uh, fair mm. because it was avoidable and uh, the Mercedes did squeeze the Audi and that car was certainly a, a podium car. 84 pits, which is Nico Verdonk out. I think Ben Schneider probably gets back in now, doesn't he, on the rotation. Nico Verdonk, the Belgian driver, this car has been there or thereabouts in the top 10, but it's never sparkled in the way that it did last year. The sister car, 85, Max Buch at the wheel of it, is up into fifth place now. Yeah, they've worked their way through the field, again, in a fairly sort of unspectacular manner, unlike what we saw last year. 
they've just worked away at it, been consistent, kept out of trouble. And uh, if you haven't got pace, then you've got to use all your other strengths, and that's what they've done. So there is 84, which is in a moment going to drop down and rejoin the race on a new set of Pirellis. In the meantime, we now have a lap between the two race leaders. So what has for much of the morning been seesawing back and forth now, admittedly with an extra pit stop to be taken, it does look a lot more likely for Audi, given the way that the time has ebbed away from the BMW, really in that last stint, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, we were getting some information, not from the pits, but through other journalistic sources, which indicated that there was a sensor problem, but there was no directions to whether the sensor was an ABS sensor or... And Winklehock's coming in, Winklehock's going to get in. So number one is coming in early, isn't it? It's going to be slightly short when it last stop that car. It's on its 465th lap. Oh, it's, going to, it's, it's only going to be slightly early. It's only going to be slightly early by about three laps. Okay. So it will be early, but not by very much. Not and by very much. In he goes, yeah. Randy Rast. Great stint by the German driver in the RD and... Uh, yeah, well, that was impressive. So that is going to be, as he comes over the timing line, the end of 465. Indeed. So three laps early. 23 laps still. Not too bad. Interesting as to why it's coming early, though. That's the next question for Ben, really. Well, I suspect there is a good reason for it, and it will all be to do with having now got ahead of the BMW on the road. Looking forward, not to this driver change but to the final two and where that positions themselves nailed up at mathematical models being played out in the back of the garage I mean Audi doesn't come motor racing to make up numbers and Baz Landers looks down and across to the Audi driver change there's Marcus Winkelhoff he's getting into the car you can see Lucas Lure just the exhaustion on his face yeah. apart from having a difficult stint just you know he's been driving He's been up and about for over 20 hours, and just, it, it is wearing. So 77 gets back onto the lead lap. Tires go on to number one Audi, so this pit stop will be about 112 seconds. Lucas Law looks down the pit lane as well, thinking, go on, have a problem. But it's all just so routine, isn't it? Car drops down. Engine fires up and away it purrs. All ten cylinders. And Lucasville walks off into the garage thinking, is this another one that's got away for Mark VDS? They've come so close this year, but with two and a half hours to go, are we looking at the second place car? Well, I mean, this car's been sort of flying solo really since about six, five or six hours into yeah. the event. And the sister car will actually have been during the evening hours and nighttime hours when it uh, contact with some of the wildlife around the racetrack and it had to retire because of damage acquired and, and there's been really nobody there as a support to what has been through the late hours of the night and into the early hours of the morning this car which has pretty much controlled the race but in the last hour or so with the issue Lucas Lua mentioned to us an AB an ABS issue which is probably the sensor rather than a mechanical issue so it sounds to me like it's an inconsistent problem that when you put your foot in the brake, you don't know what you're going to get. A, 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 a brake with ABS or a brake without ABS. So as we have car number one back into the race, and if that is a healthy Audi, we know no news of any dramas for that against a slightly troubled BMW. Certainly now the Audi has the advantage, but the BMW lap times are slower. Not by much, but it all adds up, doesn't it? Over two and a half hours, if it's a second or two seconds a lap then it's all going to mount up against the BMW so as I said a few moments ago it could be that the BMW is the second place car Audi number one looking strong massive change of fortunes compared to last year when the Audi's really struggled for pace here yeah let's see how man from, uh, Marcus Winkelhock beds in having taken over from Rennie Rast who had a stunning stint to Pierre Giordone looking yes checking out all the rules to see precisely you know interpretation of a rule. I mean, rules are there as a guideline, but what you can't do is have a rule of interpretation. And everybody's got a different version of the same rule, and then it's down to the authorities to determine whether one is acceptable or, or not. But Marcus Winkelhoff, now that he's on his first proper flying lap, 
let's get a gauge of the pace of the young German driver and uh, see whether he can match the speed that René Rast was extracting from this car. So he's making his way then now up through Blanchimont, heading through that long left-hander up towards the end of the lap in the first sector. Of course, it was out of the pit, so it's an irrelevant time. The second sector still going up to speed. The next lap, really, in fairness, is the one that's going to be relevant. It'll be a proper flying lap. Marcus Paltola's sector times still better, certainly the middle sector, than Frank Stippler behind him. So ABS drama or not, the BMW is still being driven as hard as it possibly can be. It is. Remember, it's on fresh rubber, of course, so that does make a significant difference. Mm. That benefit will drop away a little bit as you get into the stint. But nonetheless, the time is there. That's all you've got to do. So just under two and a half hours of the race still to run here at Spa-Francorchamps as the field works lap 467 might be number one Audi has been through 77 is about to emerge I think from the bus stop come up over the timing line over the line it will come now and 26 and a half seconds is the margin Marcus Paltzler though needs if he can to bring down that gap somehow and now it's going to be a proper fight between the in terms of sector times to see which is the quicker of the two you've got to put your money on the Audi though really haven't you Marcus Paltzler knows the car well, but is he as fast under normal circumstances as a Lucas Law or a Dirk Werner, and now specifically a Marcus Winkelhock? Well, I suspect that the differences between Marcus Winkelhock and uh, Mar uh, Marcus Patella are probably smaller than they might be between René Rass or Laurence Van Voort, but it's all, you're talking about very, very small margins, not even maybe tenths of seconds. And there is the second place BMW. And the first sector, he's only 800s down, so that ain't bad effort at all. If Marcus Paltzler uh, is having to cope with a problem that's serious, he's coping well with it. We've got another drive-through penalty just quickly. Number 80 is being penalised. That's one of the Nissans, the Wright, Strauss, Spunk and Macmillan car, and that is for track limits. Well, we even saw Marcel Fassler being advised of exceeding track limits up at the top of radio. So, even though that car is effectively out of contention, it's done in 13th place, after the contact with the, the uh, Mercedes a little bit earlier, uh, he's pushing on, pushing on to the extent he's been advised he's exceeding track limits up at Radio. Now in Pro-Am things are getting lively as well because you've just seen 53, Andrea Bertolini who is now in the lead ahead of here, 79, which has gone the way of Andrew Smith in the Barwell Run BMW, and then third is 52, Steve White. Pro-Am always delivers a good fight and this has been back and forth, back and forth, right the way through the race. BMW has a chance of winning here, but again, I think the Ferrari, AF Corsa car, and Andrea Bertolini behind the wheel is a very good bet, isn't it's, it? It's, I mean, everything is being dependent on what they can get Alexander Sim to do. I mean, he has been the, the, the star driver on that car, but uh, you know, one star driver, you need some backup, and I think that the Ferrari has got a, a stronger driver lineup in depth. 43 being warned about track limits as well. Stefano Comandini's BMW that had its uh, spin at the bus stop a little while ago. And Comandini, in fact, is on the back of this group now as they work their way down to Brussel. Up the inside goes Andrew Smith. A very good, very capable, very quick am is Andrew. Runs a property company up in Scotland. Nice collection of historic cars here and his dad go racing him. Comes then out of speaker's corner. Let's find out what's going on in Audi land because Vincent Voss is with Ben in the pit lane. Vincent, that seemed to be a slightly earlier stop than potentially you could have done. Is that uh, the case? No, no, it was planned. It was our planned stop and, yeah, it was on schedule. And once the stop was done and you had the driver change, you, you smiled and you looked very happy. Do you feel on course and comfortable now? Uh, comfortable? No, you don't feel comfortable after, after uh, 22 hours uh, and uh, this small margin between the two leading cars. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, Rene did an extraordinary job, as he normally do, but uh, this was an incredible stint, and uh, we did a very good pit stop. And uh, yeah, I think for once we gained a bit on the BMW at the stop, so yeah, yeah, uh, I am quite happy, but I will be, anyway, I will be happy because I like this kind of race. I mean, even if uh, we do not finish on the top, uh, on the top place. I like this kind of race and that's what I like to fight for. Surely you like races that you can win. Is short advantage Audi or BMW now? 
Yeah, well, it seems we have an, uh, a small advantage on the track. Early in the morning, it seems that BMW has a small advantage on the track. It's, it's difficult to tell. It's difficult to know what they are doing, you know. I, I know what we are doing, but uh, yeah. At the end, we will know in less than two and a half hours. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So, as Vincent Vos goes back to studying the timing data, his car number one leads the race. 21 hours, 34 minutes, 58 seconds down when it last went over the timing line. And we have the car clearing the lead of the race as it goes now down to Eau Rouge. 77 BMW making its way through the bus stop. So it has got quite a big margin on track. In the first sector, though, uh, BMW quicker. Second sector, Audi quicker. Final sector, uh, it was the BMW that was slightly the slower, and therefore at the end of the lap, it all adds up to the BMW being a tenth faster. So 27.2 seconds. It's still very cat and mouse, this. Yeah, I mean, we can chew it around and, and think about what might be, and uh, I don't even believe that that's our boss as much as he's keeping everything very close to us, I don't think he actually knows whether they can, they, he believes he can win the race, he doesn't know whether they will win the race. Yeah, that's right. Getting on behind, we've focused on one and 77, of course, for quite a long time, understandably. Frank Stippler, number three Audi, runs third, uh, a lap down. Stefan Ortelli, two laps down, runs fourth for Santalock. Fifth is now Max Buick in the Mercedes, and then sixth is Andrea Bertolini, heading Pro-Am. As you look at Frank Stippler coming towards us, more traffic to be sorted out. There is the leading car, number one. Behind Bertolini is Andrew Smith and then Steve Wyatt. So uh, the gap between the leading Pro-Am cars is only 22.7 seconds. Andrea Bertolini ahead of Andrew Smith. There's not much in it in Pro-Am. But number one, Audi, turns its way then now up through campus. In the first sector, four tenths gained over the BMW. But of course, it's always a bit hard to know whether that's purely down to traffic or whether it's down to something else in the car, isn't it? But we only can see one car at a time. We don't have the ability to see you know, two cars, different parts of the circuit on the split screen. But uh, you would like to think that mostly it's the ebb and flow mm. that you get in a, a long race with traffic. And you have to make compromises just simply because that's the only option. We have one page of the timing where a GPS map is offered up and you can plot the location of a car, it does seem as though 77 is surrounded by more traffic than is number one, and ahead of number one on the road, look, is number three Audi, which is about to go another lap down, that I suspect will be an easier car to lap than it might turn out to be for the BMW. Well, remember, the Audi's got the straight line performance, BMW is quick in other parts of the track, but you're not going to be able to do the overtaking in the other bits of the track, it's going to have to be normally, for example, a good run through a Rouge, up through Radion, through up the Camel Strait, and plant your car on the inside going into Lucum. Well, that isn't going to be an option, not a competitive Audi, either that's running in the lead or running in third place. And of course, an Audi is not going to make life hugely easy for a BMW to come past. Over the old start and finish area comes 77. So Marcus Palton at the wheel. His last lap was a 2.23.6, only four tenths down on the Audi, but really it needs to be four tenths up, doesn't it? If that was if that was traffic that cost him four tenths, then he didn't do a bad job in that. It's a huge time loss. It could have been a whole lot worse. Heading up then to Lecom now, there is the BMW, and behind is 63, which is Yelma Berman back at the wheel of the Mercedes that had to do that drive-through penalty for causing a collision just a little time ago. So, Audi leads here at Spa number one. Marcus Winkelhock, the man behind the wheel. have another like, catch up on how we got to where we are in the total 24 hours of Spa. The race flagged away by Felix Baumgartner who took part for Audi in this year's Nürburgring at 24 hours and as the cars accelerated away it was Lawrence Van Tour from pole position who secured the early lead. Daniel Zampieri was the first man though in strife as he had a spin coming out of the bus stop and Nick Katzberg and Stefan Mucker got together and that put the BMW off the road. Bentley pitted with steering dramas yeah, Hershey spun the Ferrari coming out of La Source and Marco Giocchi had a puncture in the 53 AF Corsa car.
Suddenly the pits were busy. On track, side by side, Audi and Bentley ran together with Guy Smith losing a place and Kevin S had to pit and try and change a fuse himself in the ART Grand Prix McLaren. Katsu Masaccio got tapped into a spin by Martin Ragginger. He was given a drive through for his pains and the pit lane was a very busy place. Ragginger then had fluid loss, spun on the liquid, others ran wide and in the traffic, Dirk Werner was very busy indeed, trying to work his way up through the slower cars. And Bass Line was not very impressed about the driving standards of some of the back markers, particularly Olivier Grutz and McLaren, who got in the way of Dirk Werner for the best part of a lap. But then the race turned angry. Off, first of all, went the SMP Racing Ferrari, just avoided by Alex Buncombe. The Ferrari was taken out of harm's way, the track was cleaned and cleared, but no sooner had we gone green than we went yellow again as Tim Mullen ploughed off the road in the Von Rahn racing McLaren. The safety car came back out, others pitted, we went green, we went yellow in quick succession as Carrie Vosje on the restart lap went off at the top of Radion. As some slowed for the yellow flag, others didn't, and Jürgen Muller went into the back of Giacomo Piccini's Ferrari. He pitted with a lot of damage. In the end, the car would be retired. Then Andrew Danilov spun, the car came back across the track, was swiped by Andrew Howard, whose Aston Martin was wrecked in the blaze, and then others piled unsighted into the wreckage. René Ras took over car number one, saw a green and yellow flag in quick succession, and decided to play it safe, and therefore backed right off. Steve Earl was punted around by the 22. Team Parker Racing Audi, and he dragged the Kessel Racing Ferrari back to the pits. 66, with its damage repaired, came back out. The water temperatures kept going up, and eventually a rabbit was ingested into the engine, and it did for both. Bonaccini and Vasiliev off at La Source, and then another yellow flag, quickly followed by a red. Vadim Kogai and Marcus Mai had come together, the two Ferraris out of the race, and the race had to be suspended whilst Marcus Mai was airlifted to hospital. Into the pits, under a red flag, came the number three Audi. Everybody else had to stop behind the safety car, either on the pit straight or out in the forests. And then there was the debate with the officials and WRT as to whether the car should have had work done on it, done on it under a red flag. The rules say yes, but if you want to do that, you'll get a drive-through penalty. The team elected to take that. They got the car ready to go. They did the first drive-through, though, under the safety car conditions. No, said the officials, it's got to be under a green flag. And that meant that Christopher Meese had to serve a second drive-through, which cost the car effectively another minute. So as number three went through the pit lane and back into the race with a heavy fuel load, it was sparking its way through Eau Rouge and powered its way uphill. For the drivers, for the teams, they had a busy and a long night ahead of them. For the fans, there was the disco to go to. There were all the trade stalls, places to go and eat and drink, and the firework display to enjoy as well. The teams battled their way through the night, which lost the TDS number 12 BMW and also the Amman Racing Team Aston Martin. Lorenzo Bontempelli lost a wheel on his outlap from the pits. A marshal gained a wheel nut. The car found its way back to the pit lane, although it lost quite a lot of time in the process. As the fans clambered out of their tents, ready to watch the action, the Belgian fans were pleasantly surprised to see Mark VDS, Belgian team, take on WRT, Belgian team. Others just wanted some kip. Rene Ras, hustling on in number one, almost came to grief with Nigel Farmer in the Mercedes. He went for the inside line, but it just did not pay off for him, and eventually Farmer got out of the way. Then we had another brief safety car period after Claude Gosselin head-butted the wall, coming out of Blanchimont with a lot of front damage. Santelok had a discussion with the race officials. Nissan had to change yet more punctured tyres and brake discs. Uh, Some of them ablaze had to be sorted out by jump. Black Falcon. We had a real spate of punctures in the early hours of the morning. 77 BMW now left to uphold honours of Mark VDS and indeed BMW generally pitted for a new set of tyres. And Harold Primack got on board his Mercedes only to get involved with Michael Beddoes when he spun. Rast, Vantour and Winkelhock looking strong in number one. 77 BMW with what we now learn to be an ABS problem, losing a little bit of time. The floor had to be repaired on the number seven Bentley. Cedric Mezard went off the road in 42 Ferrari, and there were some teams who were not having a happy time at all. The 18 Black Falcon Mercedes had a punctured tyre 
number two got caught up with the 63 Mercedes. That badly delayed Marcel Fassler and dropped the car down to 12th place. 63 got a drive through for its pains. So that put the emphasis on number one to try to catch BMW 77. And the car was able to catch and pass and pull away to secure the lead of the race. Mark VDS's confidence may be misplaced as Stefano Comandini had a spin at the bus stop. In came 77, number one leading the way. Eventually it put a lap on the BMW and that was a big blow to Mark VDS. It seemed as though all the hard work was going to come to nothing. It got the lap back though as into the pit lane came the Audi. Baz Leiders and Lucas Lur looked on down the pit lane as car number one with Marcus Winkelhock at the wheel now leads the way. Two hours and 14 minutes of the race still to run and the, the race leader Marcus Winkelhock then now with 28.7 seconds in hand and we still think that the Audi has to make one stop more than the BMW but whether that's going to really give the advantage back to BMW now that it's got this slight pace issue we'll have to wait and see that said the last lap for Winkelhock was a 225 as against a high 223 from Marcus Paltola. So the story's yeah, not over. Uh, it's not over at all. And just, I think, interestingly also, is Frank Stippler in third place, one lap down. Again, a second a lap slower than the BMW. And we've just been joined in the booth by Andy Merrick, who has stepped out of Bentley number seven after what had been a really good last couple of races. Two wins, Andy. Um, this has been a bit tougher, hasn't it? <laughs> it certainly has been, yes. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think uh, all things considered, been it our first our first 24-hour race, we've talked in the past that we've done 30-hour endurance yeah. tests, but there's nothing like uh, being being out with your competitors. And I can still I can say we, we can hold our, hold our heads very high, really. I mean, currently in 13th place to come. You know, if you look at where we were after the first couple of hours, down in 50th, yeah. um, we were very very unlucky getting caught uh, caught up in somebody else's debris with I think just so many crashes in those first few hours. We seem to be victim to that, so um, it's been an incredible fight back from, from Team M Sport Bentley and, um, and Car 7 to get back up into 13th place. Um, so I think all things considered with the, with the first 24-hour race, it's um, we can hold our heads high and I'm very proud. Those first hours, to us watching, just felt like a race we'd never seen before with so much destruction. I mean, from where you were, could you think you'd ever been in a race anything like that? Uh, it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, there's, there's, there's a number of things. To, to have such... Such a f so many crashes in the same places, you know, the, the same corners all the time, over and over again, and the most dangerous parts of the circuit. You know, Blanchemont, Eau Rouge, that we shouldn't be at this sort of level. We shouldn't be having crashes like that. Um, I was half expecting, to be honest, um, a message over the radio from from the race director to tell us to all calm down. Yeah. Uh, or certainly certain individuals, but um, <laughs> it's it's one of those things. As I say, I think that 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 definitely hurt us. We got some some debris caught up in the brake uh, in the brake system, and um, that that definitely delayed the the car seven. But. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know the pace at times has been fantastic. I mean, uh, certainly through the night we were very, very quick and um, very consistent as usual. Managed the double stint tyres, which I think helped us as well. So um, we're, we're we're hanging on in there at the moment. It probably looked very unlikely that we're going to be able to improve too much unless there's any misfortune for somebody else. But um, you know, there's still still a couple of hours to go, which is um, you know. You've got to consider our normal Blanc Pan races are three hours. Yeah. So we've well, um, just really started, haven't we? Exactly. Yeah. What are the big positives that you take away from this? I know the result may not be what you wanted, but when you go home and think about the weekend, what do you take out of it as the good bits? Uh, so much because um, you know you, you've got we've got so much more data now to to go back and for for M Sport and Bentley to have a look at um, to be able to analyse. I mean, just simple things like you know with the. Is, is there a way of stopping that debris getting into the into the braking system that we had, which you don't get in private testing? Because um, sure. you're the so, only car there. Because of course you're the, yeah. you're the only car, so there might be two cars there. So um, yeah, the, the team have done some fantastic pit work. Um, you know, as usual as they have done all season. Really, they've shown that um, you know they're not only race winners in, in the world of rally, and they are they're here to stay as uh, as, as winners in, in in motorsport. So there's a lot that we can take, and uh, we're growing as a team. I think you know it, it must be stressed that first 24 hour race in, in, a, in, a, in a race that says competitive you know in a one makes you know series in fact that all the cars are the same um class in fact it's not like Le Mans where there's you no, know, no, sure. p1 p2 and uh, and the different gt classes i think uh, to be so competitive and um you know it's 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 not bad at all we're watching at the moment number three audi which is frank schnipper at the wheel working his way through traffic of course 
he's busy in third place. He's trying to get past people who are having their own races and don't want to be compromised. How hard is it for a quick car to get through the traffic like this? Because, as you say, everyone's got a car built to the same spec. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the, uh, the Audis are very strong in traction. Certainly, if you look at them coming through that final chicane, they look yeah. to be fantastic there. So they're probably quite good through that. But you, all, you always work to your strengths. Um, and the balance of performance that, um, that you know, we've been hit, we know that we've been hit quite hard for this race. Um, but still, I think um, you know it's testament to, to, to SRO that um, you know they actually get the, the times to be so close and so competitive. Um, but it is tough. I mean, it's very tough with the with the different different cars, but also the different drivers out there. Now, this is your car, isn't it? It's so Kaney, is it? It's, uh, I think it is, yeah. Um, it's going quite quickly, so it might be him. Yeah. <laughs> Talk us around the lap. Yeah, so here you're approaching Blanchimont, just nipping a little bit of uh, extra room on the outside, flat out in, in, uh, throughout the race, really. So coming into the final bus stop chicane, very bumpy here, as you can see the car just diving down. Trying to avoid going into the ABS. Normally, in a, in a um, you know, there's a big, big steering input through there, as you can see, trying to, trying to get the car through that final tight chicane. But, um, yeah, and then and, and same into La Source, you know, in a, in a normal sprint race, you really do rely on the ABS quite hard. But um, here you try and look after the look, look after the brakes a little bit more. Uh, we've we've changed pads that was always planned, um, but uh, you know, taking out of the ABS, it manages to uh, to save save the the brakes a little bit more. And then obviously the famous Eau Rouge, which um, yeah, in qualifying and all the way through this um, throughout this race, the, the Bentley GT3 has been really really special through there. Yeah, um, I think there's been <laughs> lots of fans that have been coming up and just saying how. You know, obviously, it doesn't. It looks good statically, but going through there, I think at night it uh, it sounded and, and, and looked fantastic. So, uh, yeah, now the cars work really, really well. We can't, we, we we couldn't be happier really with uh, certainly the performance and um, you know the team the team effort and team spirit is has um, is, is been really good. Got a couple more things I just want to quickly throw at you. One of them is track limits. We keep having these messages on the screen about driving standards, flags being shown, drivers being told to respect track limits, some drive-through penalties. Your take on this now, you racing at modern Grand Prix circuits with all this extra runoff, what do you make of this track limit regulation and the situation we're in? Well, I think, um, you know, they're, they're pretty fair, to be perfectly honest, the organisers. They, they give you a couple of warnings each driver before you before you get hit. I, I have to admit that if we go back to the previous race at Paul Ricard, um, there was some people, you know, in, in the driver's briefing, it was it was said there that at seeing the fast right hander at the end of the straight that we were going to be track limits there, but it was evidently clear. I think under the BMW of um, TDS, I think it was, you know, was 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 going down to Bandol at that corner. I think to be perfectly <laughs> honest, he was going so far off the track. So I think the only issue comes into into consistency, yeah. um, and that obviously comes into the you know the human the human interpretation of it all. But uh, I have to say, I mean, you know, we, you've had your fair warnings. It's been communicated to the drivers. We get that communication from pit wall. Okay. Um, I've got no arguments with it, to be perfectly honest. It's um, certainly at this race, it's been, it's been fair. Fine. My final question is, you're standing here in Civis. So is that you, Dub? I'm not too sure. I think I, we'll see how we had it. We just had to, we had a puncture. So oh, okay. the plan was for me to definitely get back in. But maybe with that puncture, it might just be either Guy or Steven just, just doing a short stint. Um, extra probably guy might might finish we'll let uh, we'll see I've, I've just had a nice bath so uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the best way to try and recover so getting out the car getting uh, getting in the ice bath and then in the shower and uh, now just sit around in, in shorts until uh, yeah, you can tire yourself out just just sitting around it's very very hot now it's, it's not just the the, the, the the ambient temperature it's very quite feel very humid um, so just trying to keep yourself as nice and cool. Plus, I'm, I'm a Brit aboard, so I've got to be in uh, I've got to be shorts. shorts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Andy, if you are going to get back in the car, good luck. Thanks for coming to see us. Good luck to the Bentley boys for the remaining, what have we got, two hours and seven minutes or so. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers, Andy. Thanks very much indeed. Andy Merrick then, part of the two-race winning Bentley driver crew, along with Stephen Kane and Guy Smith. And uh, hopefully we will see Andy back in the car before the very end. He's become quite an accomplished sports car and GT racer in a pretty short space of time. And uh, number seven currently running in... 13th place as we go on board with the number 18 Nissan. Yeah, I mean, just listening to the interview and the thing I felt was very relevant was your, the concurrence of my opinion of, of what was going on in the early phases of the race. And, and I think uh, Andy was saying very much the same thing. It, it was just, everybody had gone mad. I mean, were, it was as if they'd lost all sense of judgment and control. And uh, tragically, or not tragically, but certainly some of the accidents that we saw were very, very significant, big accidents. And, uh, you know, there are drivers who are still being looked after in hospital and are recovering, but we don't need that level of aggression. And on a racetrack such as this, where there are fewer margins for error, unlike, say, Paul Ricard, which Andy was talking about, where I know I picked up on a lot of the 
excessive use or runoff area, but the race director there decided that there was no advantage to be gained by doing it, so therefore there was no penalty applied. I disagree with that, because I think if you allow something like that to be okay on one racetrack, then drivers are going to do it everywhere. Now this is the number 80 Nissan that we're riding on board with at the moment. It is Nick McMillan and the car is 22nd. It's had a pretty unhappy run really with punctures and early dramas this car. But Tom Neville and his merry men are battling on, getting the gamers to the flag, aren't they? Because uh, the bulk of the driving force made up of the uh, PlayStation GT Academy competition winners. We've got Alex Buncombe in there and Captain Masaccio as seasoned racers. And there's certainly no question mark over their pace, but uh, Nick McMillan racing here for the first time, coming out of the bus stop. And all of them belie their lack of real race experience, don't they? Yeah, and you can just see the way Nick came out of the chicane, very much you know, off the throttle in the middle of the racetrack. Uh, I mean, almost, almost sounding like he was in a high gear. Now, one of the Bentleys is just, that's probably Stephen Kane it is. You can tell with Stephen Kane's car. The rear has got that funny blackness, whether it's oil or whatever. It's just the aerodynamics have managed to get it to a stick to the back of the car, but only on the left-hand side. Stephen Kane pounding away. Two minutes, 24 his last lap. So slightly slower than the top three, top four on average are running. But, you know, again, he may have had a car, another bit of traffic on the lap. So it's, it's difficult. The pace right now, Marcus Winkelhock, 2.25. Marcus Paltella, 2.23. Frank Stippler, 2.25. Stefano Telly, 2.23. What does it tell you? Traffic. Traffic, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All it is is traffic. Because the last time the gap was up to 30.6 seconds between Winkelhock and Paltella. Uh, but it's coming down on the next lap because of good sector times being posted. But there's not that much to choose between them. But the Audi just does seem to be the quicker car. And it's, it's in this race, at the point we are, it's strength. And again, Andy was referring to its traction off the chicane, yeah. which is very good. But it's also, they've been the beneficiaries of assistance in the BOP, the balance of performance. And that is definitely, you know, in terms of straight line performance, they've gained something which they didn't have here last year. And uh, there was unhappiness about the fact that they were so far back in qualifying. They did work their way forward eventually in the event itself, but it took the full 24 hours before they could get anywhere near the podium. Whereas right now they've been challenging for that win all the way through this race. And there is a car that has cracked up the order into, into uh, now a competitive class lead. It's the AF Corsa Ferrari of Andrea Bertolini. And it is running uh, sixth overall. More importantly, it's leading Pro-Am, but it's a car that has crept up the order. And now, of course, at the end, they unleash Andrea Bertolini to try and secure the class win. And it is 46 seconds ahead of its opposition, but it's only 1.4 seconds now on the road uh, behind the car in fifth place. The trouble is there are three laps between them. So uh, the actual gap in terms of there, you can see it, the time is very slender, uh, but in terms of laps, it's three behind. So six is as good as it's going to get for that car, allowing for the fact that nobody else has problems ahead. But a pro-am victory is what they're after. And Andrea Bertolini, the man leading the class at the moment. And you've got to go some to beat Bertolini, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, we're coming up to the stage that uh, BMW, a Curie cast, that is, are uh, going to put Alexander Sims in, we believe, for the final two stints. So that pit stop probably going to come up for the currently running in seventh place, a Curie cost BMW. So Alexander Sim will get in and he will then have to drive the wheels off this car as he's done throughout this event. I mean, he is absolutely shone in the Curie cost BMW. And John, there was lots of discussion as to if that was going to happen or not, um, because uh, there were down at Barwell Motorsport, Alexander Sims in very animated discussion um, with the bosses to work out exactly what the strengths would be, when to bring him in, because they are losing quite a bit of time at the moment with Alistair Smith at the wheel, and they want to compete for that class victory. And with Andrea Bertolini, the sort of most pro driver in that 53 car, they need their fastest driver in the BMW Z4. Uh, yes. Absolutely, there's no question. That's the situation that they're in. But of course, I mean, has Alexander Sim done, will he have done over his a lot of time allowance or can he run right up to it and I suspect that the team are looking at that particular equation to see what they need to do clearly you know, 
car being driven now, driven very well, but not at the pace of Bertolini. The last lap for Bertolini was 2.26. In fairness, the last lap for the BMW was only a second off there. Yeah, it's not so bad. It, it's ebbing and flowing again, you know, whether one gets traffic somewhere and the other gets a clear lap. But the bottom line is, and I say respectfully, Alexander Sim is going to do the job in this car of trying to get the, the award, the winner's Pro-Am award on the top of the podium. And uh, everybody else in the team will have done a wonderful supporting job, but that one driver has got the capacity to take that victory. So, Andrew Smith at the wheel of 79, and Alexander Sims to take the car over for the very end. It's going on in Gentleman Trophy, where Peter Mann is back at the wheel of uh, 51. That's 42 Ferrari that turns its way slowly, I would suggest, out of Bruxelles. That is Maxi, uh, Martin Van Hove, rather, who is fourth in the class at the moment, having led it early on before had a lengthy pit stop. So 42 looking a little bit sluggish now, but it is still circulating, aiming for a podium in class. Marcel Fassler, number two, up into 11th place overall. Now he's 52, Steve Wyatt, the experienced American in the Ferrari 458. Turning his way out of Pouin now. And got two more pit stops, I think I'm right in saying now, for the two leading cars still to serve. And therefore, on the current pace, it is going to be an Audi win, isn't it? Unless there's something as a sting in the tail that this race has for us. There goes Steve Wyatt then, up towards the exit of campus. Comes up through, as the road opens out, all the runoff tarmac on the outside there. And then accelerates his way up towards the Fast left at the Cub, Paul Frere, and then on towards Longchamp, heading towards the end of the lap once more. Car looks lovely. Marzo Zadel, Andrea Bertolini leading this Pro-Am category. The Ferraris shining here in Spa in a sunny early afternoon. And it's the BMW between the two Ferraris that maybe might spoil the potential of a, a whitewash in the, the Pro-Am Cup. Let's see if I come across the line. And uh, two minutes 27 against uh, Bertolini's 2.25. There's the car that did lead Pro-Am for much of the early part of the race. Andrea Rizzoli is now behind the wheel of the Castellacci Piccini Guy Ferrari, but it lost so much time having to change the starter motor that that's out of the hunt, isn't it? I mean, it's a shame. That was, again, a very, very strong package. There's the Mercedes in the pits, number 86. Max Boot brought it in, didn't he? I think it works great, that livery. That Petroda's colour scheme on that car looks really good to me. Well, it's one you're familiar with if you've watched motorsport on TV. Mm -hmm. But it's just the colours and it works nicely on that yes, car. Yes, it does. It, you know, the, the shape, the sculpting and the scalloping in the door is highlighted by the Petronas blue-green, however you interpret it. The car rumbles away. So Mercedes last year, HTP was the team to beat. This year the cars have struggled, but maybe they haven't had the ultimate top driver partnerships this year. Peter Mann brings the Gentleman Trophy leading Ferrari down the pit lane. The AF Corsa car is on its way out of the pit because AF Corsa is in the F1 pits at the very top, where here Team Parker Racing is. This is the class opposition. Julian Westwood is the man that's brought the car in. A bit of tape needed on the top of the car. And in a moment the car will be sent back. We'll find out in a moment whether Julian Westwood stayed behind the wheel or whether there's been a change. It's Julian Westwood, Leo Machitsky, Ian Loggy, the car's owner and the experienced Carl Rosenblatt. And bearing in mind that it's had a couple of skirmishes, one indeed when Rosenblatt put it off the road early in the race, to be second in class is a good effort. I mean, just keep out of trouble. Be metronomic in your lap times as much as you can. Bearing in mind you're having to drive a race and you're going to be overtaken and being overtaken. And I once drove for a man called John Wire, very famous man who ran Porsches at Le Mans and Golf Mirage and so on and so forth. And all he was concerned about was consistency, consistency, consistency. Mm. He would tell us drivers, I want a lap time, particularly at Le Mans, whatever it happened to be, the lap time. I don't want you to go faster, but I don't want you to go slower. I want you to do this to that time. Because that was the way he believed that you could win that race. And what's any different today? And he wasn't noted for his patience for people that didn't do as they were told. Well, I think he respected flair and individuality, but 
in a particular in an endurance race like Le Mans, which was the principal race of the day or Daytona 24 hours as well. Those were the races that what's the point in trying to win the race in the first hour or six hours? Just stick to a predetermined lap speed within the context of having to overtake and and you know in certain circumstances you will lose time but net out at something like a set time and uh, that's where your results will come the porsche there of the fark auto tech team getting out of the way of the race leader it is otto Kloss, the man that he's currently driving that car porsches we only had really uh, in the pro-am or the gentleman trophy this year there isn't a pro cup entry so there's no chance of a Porsche victory, there's no chance of a Ferrari victory because we haven't got any Pro Cup Ferraris either, so uh, that's why we're talking about those cars as uh, back markers almost as into the pit lane comes number two, Marcel Fassler then, so trying to make up ground after his earlier delay, but 11 laps down on the leader, so it was a very lengthy delay with the damage sustained after the contact with the Mercedes. Yeah, we didn't really get to see what the damage was, we saw the bit leaning into the squeeze going into the source and then a long time to damage to the suspension. A great, I mean, a great job in the pits by the WRT team to change that suspension. And the last time lap for Marcel Fassler was at 2 minutes 25. So what the true pace of the car is, uh, wait and see, is that Andre Lotter going to get in? That might give us maybe an indication of what the outright pace of this number two car is going to be all about. But you can imagine coming from Le Mans, and I mean a difficult event for these three drivers, bearing in mind the difficulties the team had in practice and qualifying. And here they are now, all the way down outside the top ten, struggling to try and get just one more position to say we finished in the top ten. We've seen Andre Lotter do the event before. It was two or three years ago, wasn't it, when he was uh, hit at the bus stop by Adam Christodoulou in the McLaren that year. It uh, delayed the car quite badly, so the driver change has happened. Is there a deal going on between... Adam Christodoulou in this particular number two. I mean, it, it did this two years ago, and then it's done it again. Exactly. Here at the source. Magnetic attraction. New set of tyres required on number two. And these mechanics, not Look just on that. this car, I mean, that, but that, on every that car, is, they burnt the money. That is tremendous. Great effort by the WRT team to the car, turn that car around, and now uh, underway. So Andre Lotter makes his way across the line, then all the way back down the other side. There's the 26 car, currently in fourth place. Stefano Telli brought it in. And that team is oh so close to being there, but it's just lost that little bit too much time early on. Yes, they do. And again, I mean, it's a smaller team. A little bit of a, an adjustment on the rear. Oh, is that oil going in? Actually, it is oil going in. So away it goes. Fourth place. Can Stefan Mortelli, Greg Gilver and Edward Sandstrom get that car onto the podium? These is the, this is, I should say, the way the classification looks at the moment. Audi number one, BMW 77. You can see the way the gap is going up again. Slowly but surely, lap by lap, it just creeps up a little bit now. 35 seconds, give or take. In third place, Audi number three from then Audi number 26. 86 Mercedes, the Petronas livery car. And sixth is the Pro-Am leading Ferrari. This is the car that's now Andrea Bertolini uh, behind the wheel. So Andrew back. Smith is in, in the Mercurio Cars BMW, and we wonder now, with one hour 52 minutes to go, has that decision been made to put Alexander Sim in for the final two stints, or not? I would think you, they're going to have to. Well, they? I think Alexander Sim was accepting that this was going to happen, and I think he would love to to do the job, knowing that he's got the pace. And uh, oh, well, look at that, nice, bit warm, bit warm in there. Stefan Ortelli talks to Edward Sandstrom. Greg Gilver takes over the car. How is 77 BMW doing? First sector, quite a chunk of time lost. Second sector, quite a chunk of time lost. Now that car of course was last in on lap 4-6-1 wasn't it? I think he's got another seven laps to go on this stint so down to the bus stop comes Marcus Pautala he's going to carry on for one more lap at least as in has come number three Frank Stippler whenever he does the Spa 24 hours he 
seems to be incarcerated in the car for a very long time. At least he's been given a new drinks bottle. But I mean, WRT it, gets its money's worth out yeah, of Frank. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they know what Frank Stripper does. He just gets in the car, knocks out the lap times, brings the car back, very rarely gets involved in incidents with other cars on the racetrack. What you would like in a team is a strong team member. He may not be the ultimate bright star in a, a team of stars. As the car is being spun around and it's going back in yeah, to the garage. Down, ben, what news? Uh, well, I'm going to head down to Audi now. I'm just halfway out the pit lane. Just to say that they've changed the strategy in that three car because it normally would have been James Nash to get in that car at this point. And they actually have screens at the back of WRT displaying what strategy each of the cars are doing. Okay. However, as I walked through after lunch, I saw that James Nash's name had been removed and they were doing double stints for the two remaining drivers of Mies and Stippler. So they are still pushing on, but the car now being wheeled into the garage. Give me a couple of minutes and I'll tell you what's going on down there. I wonder if that's anything to do with that gearbox problem you were suggesting earlier on. Or is it a second disc and pad change? And if it is, then are we going to have to have the same for the leading car? So the plot starts to thicken a bit, doesn't it now? Over the timing line goes uh, Greg Gilver as he makes his way down to La Source. This is the car still in fourth place, but it's about to gain a lap back against number three. So third and fourth all of a sudden for the last place on the podium starts to look a bit more interesting, except that number three is quickly whisked about out again. That didn't take long. I'd like to know what it was they were doing. I mean, it can't have been a brake uh, change, surely, but... Tony, they took the car in and spun it round and, and spun it back out again. The reason we go in the garage is you can have an unlimited number of people working on the car, but it was so quick. I mean, yeah, well, I'm fascinated to know what it was. The question is, if it was a scheduled pit stop, you'd just do tyres, fuel, driver change. If there's another issue, you stick it in the garage. Mm. What was the other issue? What do we not know mm. that Audi had to work on, albeit for maybe 25, 30 seconds, get the car spun round and back out again? So Frank Stippler stays behind the wheel. Double stinting drivers. So poor old James Nash not having very much track time at all this weekend, is he? No, and, and as a consequence, Frank Stippler and Christopher Mees have been doing you know, a, a lot of the 90, well, 85 percent of the driving. They were two driver in a race like this. The pace has been run out with all the issues that have gone on in the race. A, a race of appalling six hours, first six hours. I have to stop talking about it. <laughs> and Benoit Trellier has joined us in the commentary box. Now, Benoit's car, number two, is up into 12th place. Is this a race that kind of got away from you? It looked so promising early on and then damaged just a few hours ago. It was really dealt you a bad hand. Yeah, the, um, it was a very promising race, as you said. And uh, unfortunately, we had a misunderstanding with one driver. And uh, he didn't see us, so I don't know exactly what's happened. I didn't talk with him, but I uh, was inside and he closed the door and we had damage on the car. Uh, it was pretty clean from last night, you know, yeah. after all the crashes, everybody was giving the way on the blue flag and that time it didn't happen. And unfortunately, uh, we got that problem, but um, it's, a, it's a very interesting race. And uh, I had a difficult night, uh, but uh, after that, uh, we, we found the uh, our uh, marks and then and then we set up a good tire pressure and everything and then we were we were in a good pace it would have been a great story if you could have won Le Mans and Spa in the same year was this your idea as drivers to come and do it or did Dr Ulrich have a great brainwave and say come on come and do Spa yeah it was uh, we were talking about that a few years ago already and mm -hmm. um, and then this winter they talk again about it and and then we we were really motivated to do it I have to say that we were not uh, enough prepared to be okay. to fight for the win because we are a very talented driver here who knows very well the tires, the car, and everything. And you can be very good in one category and not that good. You have to know it's uh, very professional in both uh, categories, and uh, you have to do uh, everything uh, well. And uh, even if we were in uh, one of the best team with the best car, it's difficult to catch with the with, uh, with, uh, drivers like in number one and number three. But how easy is it to adapt from all the downforce of a WEC Audi to a GT3 car, which must feel like a road car in comparison? Yeah, exactly. With uh, okay, Marcel is a little bit more used to it uh, because he's doing Nurburgring uh, nearly every year. But for Andre and me, it was quite difficult. For me, it was the first time. I just did few uh, few laps in the GT Tour a few uh, months ago, and uh, I have to say, I was a bit lost at the beginning. But um, anyway, I didn't want to take any risk and. That's why also it 
takes time for me to, to get the good pace. But uh, after I got the confidence, it was pretty good. And, uh, and then I start to have fun. And this is the view from your car, which yet again is in traffic. Traffic is such an issue for drivers. It must be so frustrating for you. Yeah, you have to, to deal with um, with it, and it's uh, all the same cars, uh, same category, so it's even more difficult than in Le Mans, but you're not overtaking uh, many cars every lap, so it's just you don't know the drivers here so much, you don't know how they react, and uh, it's a weak point for us because we have no clue about how they are doing, and uh, maybe I would have been more... Uh, more safe uh, with um, Mercedes uh, by knowing who was driving, mm -hmm. and uh, don't say I don't say that he he, he was not good uh, uh, driver, but he just didn't see me and yeah. he was pushing. Maybe he missed completely his corner, you know, uh, the corner before. So I thought he was uh, giving up uh, or giving away to me, you know, because he, he had the blue flag. And this kind of thing you have to know, and uh, this is experience, and um, and uh, the, the you have to know all the drivers and everything. The circuit remains an absolutely fantastic one, doesn't it? I know we've had a race littered with accidents, but it's a great challenge and it certainly seems to be one that drivers love. Yeah, it's uh, one of the most beautiful circuits in the world and uh, it's uh, up and down, uh, very nice around uh, with a nice green uh, grass. <laughs> and uh, No, I have to say it's a, it's a good, uh, very good circuit where you have a very good feeling. It's, um, it's very tough to keep the car really well on the track and uh, it's part of the job to control the car, so it's really good. Would you come back and do this event again? Uh, I have to say that I would like to win it, and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it would be nice. Uh, honestly, this year would have been fantastic to win, but uh, we knew that it would have been nearly impossible. But uh, now we got, uh, we got a good pace at the end of a race. If we want to do it, I think we have to do it more properly and uh, practice more in the car before and with the tyres. So do more either blanc pan races or domestic GT races? Exactly. Yeah. Just talk me through this part of the circuit. Very, very fast part heading up towards the end of the lap. What sort of speed, what gear are we in here? Uh, we just shift up uh, in a six gear before Blanchimont and uh, you just lift up a little bit in a Blanchimont. It's moving, you get some time snap obviously because you are really on the edge. And uh, so about the speed, it must be, I don't know exactly, but maybe it must be around 260. Quick enough. Quick enough. Quick enough, I tell you. <laughs> Benoit, I better let you go, because I know you've got things Thank to you do. Very Thank you very much indeed for coming up to talk to us. Benoit Trellier from the WRT Audi team. Le Mans winner this year. Disappointment comes at Spa, but great to have had the three Le Mans winners this year on the grid. Thank you very much, Audi, for sparing drivers for us during the course of the race. The car is in 12th position, but there's still an awful lot more to come here with now an hour and three quarters and counting in the total 24 hours of Spa. Well, the race may be hotting up, but I can assure you, ambient temperature equally is beginning to heat up yeah. very quickly indeed. And the sun is getting higher in the sky and the cloud is dispensing more than it's been at any part of the day. So, again, just another little joker being played in this battle for the victory here this afternoon. Marcus Winkelhock still leading 42 seconds from Marcus Paltala and Frank Stippler two laps down in third place. The battle is really between two drivers, two manufacturers. And what's going to happen in an hour and 42 minutes? I don't think even Bernard uh, Trulia, I bet uh, Bernard Trulia has a clue. Uh, no. He um, may have an idea. He but, might have an idea. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very tight. Is that number one Audi absolutely bulletproof? Is there anything that is going to derail it with so little time out of the 24 hours still to go? And is anything going to throw a lifeline back in the way of the BMW? It's probably unlikely because we're seeing you know, a very, very strong pace coming from the car all the way through. The only thing that's going to be an issue is the inevitable one, and that is you make a misjudgment when it comes to lapping a group of cars. You put yourself into jeopardy, into a position where there is no escape. So you just need to think that even though I'm in the lead of this race, even though I've got a 46, 47 ad second advantage, I don't need to make an unnecessary contact with a car that is not involved in my race. And therefore, the contact could lead to a pit stop and could lead then to the loss of the lead. And it's that kind of thinking that the top professional drivers have to do. It's slightly different for some of the drivers that are, they do it, it's their, partly their hobby, partly they've got another occupation, because their career isn't going to depend. But these drivers' career depends on them doing the right thing 
as often as they can and not falling for the sucker mistakes. And we're going to have the next round of pit stops for the two cars, either on the same lap or just one lap apart, but they are going to almost coincide now. The two strategies are about to converge on this next round of pit stops. So, number one, number 77 are on the same lap. There's going to be no advantage gained really for either car if they come in on the same lap because they'll uh, both be in the pits at the same time. But a 23 lap stint last time was done by Audi number one. That would bring it in on lap 488. We're on lap 487 now. And the BMW's 27 lap stint ought to take that to lap 488. So, it's going to be pretty tight this. And as I say, the chances are we're going to get them in at the same time. We've waited 22 and a half hours. And finally, we've got a race, <laughs> I mean, a proper race. And I think one of our colleagues just picked up that there are a set of discs sitting just at the entrance to the pit box in a container. And is that there just as a precaution or is that a planned pit stop? There's, well, well, Audi, we are told, should change discs and pads twice. And in now it's comes well. number one at the end of flat 487. Well, they've done one change. That came at 8.52 this morning. Let's look and see as the car makes its way down the pit lane. We will know quickly if it is going to make a, a change of disc and pad because they'll have those little trolley jacks under the car and spin it around, push it back into the garage. Just also to mention, it's done a 22-lap stint. It's one lap less than its previous one, whatever that's going to tell us. I offer you that statistic and at Mark VDS Racing is the BMW going to come in this time or is it going to do one more lap and keep on schedule of 27 laps so the fuel will go in first the driver change will take place Marcus Winkelock steps out will be Lawrence Van Four into the car Dirk, let me see him, Dirk Werner waiting for the BMW the key is is Audi are they going to be forced into the garage we know how quickly we can do a disc pad change, but more time that's lost in the pits gives the advantage more towards the BMW. The BMW has stayed out, it now leads the race, it has gone through, it was 38 seconds behind, the Audi is going to go into the garage, so this is the significant pit stop because it's about to have the discs and pads changed for the second time, it swings into the pit box, and this is the BMW's chance to try to build up a little bit of a gap. Dirk Werner is going to take the car over. I predict at the end of the next lap, 488, it will be another 27 lap stint. And BMW need this pit stop to be a slow one. And they're doing everything aside from changing the discs and pads, making sure that all the air intake, all the gauzes that cover the radiator are protected from rub lumps of rubber or any other rubbish that may be being projected at the car. Uh, cleaning it out to ensure that the cooling efficiency is as good as it can be. So there is what is an effect will be the lead car if it stays on track or will it overtake in the pit? No, won't it? Because they're well, before no, it, the early pit. It, it leads now anyway because yeah. it, they've both done the same number of laps. That car's not moving. The other one is half a lap ahead. So BMW leads, but it's going to come in at the end of this lap. And is this purely discs and pads now? I think it is being undertaken. They've got the wheel back on on the yeah. left side. Can't quite see the right side. The car is being pulled out. Been a great job by the ID team. No. Get those jacks from underneath the car. They are jacks. Off we go. Away it goes. Back into the race and try and grab news from the pit box in a moment. There then is the current leading car. And it's about to come in. Indeed so, because there is Dirk Werner. And this is the end of lap 488. So whereas WRT are kind of going a lap less now and again on the pattern. 23 laps down to 22 laps. 27 still being banged in by the BMW. Well, looking into the Audi garage, just checking, they're looking at discs, pads. It's difficult to see precisely what's going on, but there is the lead BMW, and it will make its way into the pits as they come up into a late cut in, and uh, Mercedes almost overran the car, just as it had to get out of the throttle, and it didn't accelerate where the Mercedes was accelerating. So, 488 laps done, 77 about to come down the pit lane as the race leader as they're back on track goes the Audi now if you put the pad change in that's another 30 seconds on top of about 112 as the average pit stop time so if the BMW does not have to do discs and pads it should uh, save itself 30 seconds as well we are being told that the number one Audi had a sticking pad in that change so even allowing for that it was still blooming quick 
I mean, it, it's, it's like a poetry in motion. But if you get one little ice, one little issue, it just skews the whole package. So that one sticking pad just upsets the momentum and suddenly there's panic for about a millisecond. A millisecond, that's all, yes, because you don't do panic at Audi. You just deal with the problem. Well, there is a pad. I don't know, yeah. That was the one that was the offending pad. The BMW. Uh, fresh front, fresh rear is going on. They do it the other way around. Audi does it sort of counterclockwise, and yeah. BMW do it clockwise, which is interesting because I don't know which is the more efficient, but certainly the way Audi do it, it is extremely efficient. Good stop, though, wasn't it? Away goes now Dirk Vanna. So the question is going to be where will that car feed back in relative to the uh, number one Audi? Well, there, there it is, number, number one. So it's going to be nip and tuck because the length of time it will take the Audi to get up through the field with all the traffic that it's got ahead of it is. Uh, it's a relatively clear run for the BMW all the way down, albeit at a speed limit. So it looks to me there's a very good chance the BMW is going to come out ahead of the ID. Yeah, there is the BMW right. making its way down the pit lane. But it's such a long pit lane, isn't it? Because then there's the drag up here. Yeah, it's going to be close. So I think he'll, he'll, be, he'll be on the track before the BMW gets there. It's no question in my mind. Look at the traffic ahead of him. He's got to deal with all this. He's got to get past the BMW, the Curia Cars BMW. Which so he's out there of the he is, and he's on it now. He's yeah. on the throttle because he's crossed the white line. So by the time he gets up to the top of radio, and by the time the ID gets to the top of radio, there's going to be maybe 15 or so seconds. Let's see. Of course, while the Audi is stuck in this traffic, it plays right into the hands of Dirk Werner, who leads the race. So 77, thanks to that pad and disc change, takes back P1 as the lights flash there from uh, number three, Frank Stippler, who's also there, got the number one Audi behind. Well, there was the leading car, and the last of the flashing lights at the back here is the number one Audi, which is now Rene Rast at the wheel of it, trying to work its way through the back markers. It's all a bit heart in mouth, this. Rene Rast needs to get through quickly, but not take as many risks as you might sometimes do, because he's got to keep the car out of trouble. And this is all... Oh, look, he's talking about taking risks. He had to get up from behind Frank Stippler. He got two more positions, so he's managed to do that, and uh, without damage or without contact. So this is a real charge from René Russ. Uh, the gap, we'll have to wait and see until they come across start finish line to get an accurate, but it probably was more like eight to 10 seconds maximum as they came up to Le Combe. In some respects, he was lucky that he encountered the traffic where he did, because that is an overtaking opportunity up the hill, whereas had he encountered the back markers through the twiddly bits, through the corners, it could have taken longer to get through all of them. So, as Pierre Giudone there from Team WRT, he has won the race as both a team manager and, of course, as a driver, he looks on, and he sees number one, René Rast, charging, charging, charging. Of course, the set times, moderately inconclusive on this outlap, because although Rast is charging, the first sector you can ignore because it came out of the pits. The middle sector is relevant and it's quicker than Dirk Werner, so he is hustling on. The BMW, of course, newer into its stint, whereas Rene Rast has had the car for a lap or two now, whereas Dirk Werner is just trying to get himself familiar with how the BMW now is since he last drove it and, of course, get his head around this brake issue that we've been told about. Yes, I mean, the brake issue has seemingly been not mentioned a great deal since Lucas Lohr got out of the car and, and told us. So there is the lead BMW comes across start finish line. And I calculated there was about eight to nine seconds. So there is the ID coming across now, and there's going to be about five. Oh, it is 8.8. .8. There you go. Not bad. Good call. So 0 2 on the windscreen means second position for number one, Rene Rast, who turns his way out of La Source now. Ready to head off downhill. You've got Frank Stippler running third in the race and third on the road, and that car is a lap down. So now Dirk Vanner, with a clear road around him, has got to push like crazy. He, well, he's going to do what he can. I mean, he can do no more than wring the neck of the car, as Rene Rast is doing. We've seen a stunning effort from him this afternoon and late morning. There is what Rene Rast wanted to see. Nothing but clear air between himself and the lead BMW. Heading up to Lake Holmes, sector one, a 41.2, plays a 40.2. Rene Rast is one second quicker in the first third of the lap between the start and finish line and the braking area for Lake Holmes. From the timing line to Lake Holmes, he's taken a full second out of the leader. 
I mean, we saw a brilliant stint from him. I can't say more than that. And again, he's just doing what he's paid to do, and that is absolutely commit in every way, whichever possible, to get this Audi. There's the BMW just going into the Pujol corner. And Rene Ras coming downhill. Just a little dip as the car comes on the brakes, then off the brakes, into the corner, back onto the throttle. And literally by the corner, you can see the gap shrinking between the lead and second place. So Ras here going for honours with an hour and a half to go. But 65 minutes is a stint and we've got 90, so they're going to have to make one last pit stop. What is that going to do to the order? It may well be that the Audi has already worked itself up past the BMW, but now Dirk Werner has got to push. So he lost one second in the first sector. He's lost another second in the second sector. 8.8 .8 is going to be about six, maybe even five point something come the end of the lap as the Audi blasts now through the left-hander to Paul Freire onto Blanchimont. I mean, René Rast has been in this car recently. He's familiar with it in every sense. Dirk Müller has not been in the car since this issue of the the ABS sensor problem. So it, it is an adjustment on his part, but he can't afford to spend too long making that adjustment. There is the gap between the two cars. It was 8.8 .8 seconds the last time by. It's probably nearer to 5.9. God, I'm on the money again. Absolutely. They can tell me who's going to win, can't you? Because you've got all the rest of it right. The gap's coming down and down and down and down. Maxime Martin has joined us in the commentary booth as well. And we definitely need to talk to Max because the Mark VDS BMW is leading, but the gap is coming down. We'll talk about 66, Maxime Martin's car, in a moment. Maxime, it's all a bit heart in mouth, this, isn't it? You've got Dirk Werner leading for your team, but the gap is coming down and down. Do you think he can fend off the Audi? Um, yeah, speeding-wise, I don't, I don't really think so. They have a little issue um, okay. with no ABS and no traction control. So, um, yeah, it's quite difficult. The pace is um, Audi is quicker. Um, but uh, the team is, has been always quicker on, on the pit stop, so um, it's going to be close anyway. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, difficult to say now um, how it's going to be. It's just a big frustration for you that it's the other car and not yours. I know I keep saying this, but every other sports car race, every other GT race you seem to have success in, apart from this, your home race that you really want to win. Yeah, my, my home race is for sure not um, my most successful uh, one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really, every year I'm coming here, I've, I have a good car, a good lineup, good team, a really good um, everything there to, to, make it, to make it proper. And um, yeah, everything have bad luck, uh, retirement um, issues where I just finished four. So, so yeah, struggling a bit to, to have a good result here, but. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm really happy for the team now to, to, be, to be there and fighting uh, for the lead. And uh, yeah, I'm really crossing fingers to try to, yeah, that BMW can win this race. As long as no more rabbits try and run across the track. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a strange, uh, str strange story. We had, uh, I think it's the first time, um, yeah, it's my, it's my first time I had this kind of uh, DNF. <laughs> and I think it's the first time from Augusto and Jörg Müller also. So, no, it's not common. Um, so it means that really um, we didn't have the luck with us. Um, even if we were uh, for sure already 10 laps down. Um, but at the end, yeah, we would have, we would have this rabbit. And yeah, so it's, it's not good anyway. Not good for the car, not good for the rabbit. This lead gap coming down a little bit more. So Dirk doing his best. How much difference to the way he's driving is this ABS? problem how, how much it will be affecting him what does he have to do differently do you know yeah i don't know exactly for um, sure. it's for sure difficult to to really have a, a, a proper measurement but um, it looks like that they, they lost uh, approximately one 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 second one and a half seconds um when they started to have this problem okay. and um, yeah it makes quite a lot when sure. you see on where they are playing it's um, it's a lot but uh, yeah, everything can still happen. It's still one hour thirty to go, and um, you know it's still long. Um, still one pit stop, I think, um, for for each. So yeah, but how they look strong at the end of the race now. Let's have a final word about happier things. Brilliant win in the DTM in Russia the other week. Yeah, it was just um, amazing. It was just magic, magic for me. Um, like I always said, it has been a dream for me going to to DTM, and uh, yeah, now. Now going, 
to win to win after my fifth race is just it's just amazing. So I'm looking to, to go away. Let me just quickly mention this car, the Black Falcon Mercedes, the Australian Richard Muscat at the wheel of it, and he's had some rear damage. He might have been hit, he may have gone off the road, but he's limping the car back to the pit lane. When you're on a flying lap and you come across a car like this, is it a real shock to see somebody going so slowly? Yeah, the difference with speed is it's really um, enormous, but uh, it depends where the car is, is, is on track and um, how, how they can manage to, to, to be out of, of the, out of the way. But um, yeah, now he's in really quick part now, so yeah, it's a big difference. But uh, at the end, you have some some flags, and the marshals are making a really good job about this. So yeah, it helps for sure the drivers a lot. Excellent, Max. Good to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Glad to let you go. Thank see you, you in the DTM round soon. Thank you. No doubt. So, so Maxi Marta, who will have to wait another year before he stands on the top step of the podium at the Spa 24 Hours, but one day it will happen, we're all convinced. As now you see number one Audi, Rene Ras being held up a little bit in traffic. Is that going to save Dirk Werner? Not with an hour and 24 minutes to go. It's a, it's a case of when, not if, the Audi gets back into the lead, isn't it? Yeah, it's got to be three seconds or 2.6 seconds to be exact. And I mean, also just watching the Mercedes limping its way back up, took the line in Blanchemont, which I have to say was not the smart thing to do. And again, look, not certain as to whether it was going to stay in the left-hand part of the track or the right-hand part of the track as this group of cars and Baz. I think you're conferring with what I'm suggesting, that you know, if you are limping home, limp home offline. Now here's an Audi look ahead of the leading BMW. Let's see how long it's going to be before the BMW charges past. Dirk Werner heads uphill, the Audi stays on its line. It's the gentleman trophy car, number four. Up the inside goes Dirk Werner. That was done properly. Yeah, and I mean, what he did, he did the right thing. He got under the rear wing of the RD, got drawn along with the RD straight line pace, and then just popped out, spent down the inside of it. Good cooperation from the amateur drivers in the RD. They let that car go cleanly and fairly. But there is the gap in it's down, was the last time across the line, 2.6 seconds, and it's down to what is in effect literally, well, just two and a bit. And in the first sector, another three tenths shaved off as Wolfgang Ulrich looks pretty content now about all of this. Through the traffic comes Brass. Audi gets out of the way for him, so it's going to be the next lap, I think, when we have the lead change, isn't it? It will certainly be in a couple of laps whether he can run the car down at the end of this lap and then make an overtake. What would be lap 294? They're on 293 at the minute. Is questionable again you know it, it's when it comes down to the battle for the lead different dynamic might come into Dirk yeah yeah uh, Werner's uh, mentality and suddenly he might be a bit more difficult to pass and he might be forcing the Audi to slow down on the parts of the racetrack where currently it's quick and there you can see the pit stop times which proves that although it has had less time in the pit lane number 77 uh, is perhaps now not going to win the race. We talk about the fact that the, the least amount of time you spend in the pits means you're likely to win, but not in this case because the second place car has had one more uh, pit stop. It has also spent more time, therefore, in the pits, but its speed is going to bring it through and put it ahead as it comes over the timing line. Uh, ignore the fact that number three has had over an hour and 46 minutes in the pits because it was stationary and was not permitted to go anywhere for an hour, nor was anybody else permitted to move while we had the best part of an hour uh, of the red flag race suspension last night. But it is interesting to see how many stops a car has made and how many minutes it's been in the pits for. Look at fourth and fifth, 20 stops each, but uh, the best part of five minutes difference between them. The leaders, 1.9 seconds now between them as they head uphill. Lights flash from Dirk Werner's car. He's pushing as hard as he feels he's able in that BMW and he does not want to have to get stuck behind the Mercedes here for a split second. Yeah, and he's not going to get past the Mercedes before they get into the braking zone for Le Groom. And uh, again, so the emphasis has swung to the favour slightly of Rennie Rast, who was able to break where he wanted, take the line he wanted. Now we're going to wait and see whether Dirk Werner can get down and alongside he has done so on the exit of Le Groom. And Rennie Rast also slips the Audi down the inside. So. That's probably worked out marginally favourable to the ID. Uh, the Mercedes didn't impede the BMW, it just happened to be there and it would have been responsible for the loss of maybe a couple of three tenths up at that point of the track. Downhill they come in the first sector, another six tenths taken back, so 1.3 seconds now is the margin.
between the two leading cars as they thread their way towards the pith path. Now, where are we up to with traffic? Because there are still, of course, lots and lots of cars ahead. There's probably another six or seven that they need to work through before there's another real chunk of clear track space between, or in front of, I should say, the leading 77 BMW. Uh, the, the bulk of the traffic now is actually behind these two lead cars. They've got a certain amount, but they're more spaced out than they would be if they were half a lap further around the racetrack. And running really right out to the very edge of the, the exit of that campus corner up through the Paul Frere Cove, then into the first part of Blanchemont. Really, it's the second part to the real white knuckle ride. Everybody running the white line, putting four wheels over it. No big advantage gained by the Audi through that corner. They're both pretty much flat out, but it's just the Audi has that little bit of advantage and straight line speed. Over yeah. the timing line, they can't. Let's just quickly see what the gap is. 1.9 becomes 0.7 of a second. And they made it closing up again as 0.4, 0.3 as they break up into the source. Of course, the BMW will accelerate that a little bit sooner, so the gap will stretch again. And Baz Linder sitting there powerless to do anything. The last lap between the two cars was 1.2 seconds to the advantage of the, of the Audi. The, the difficulty will come is, oh, look how wide they run coming out of, uh, out of radio, side by side, as they get into the beginning of the Camel Straight. Nose to tail, but in the new order. Audi ahead of BMW, so René Ras goes through, picks up the lead, but straight away he's got traffic to contend with himself. Can this throw Werner another lifeline? Uh, I doubt it very much, but the pace that uh, René Ras had up through the radio and got past him, I and mean, he was so quick. It was, I mean, I, the, I saw him going sideways, but by the time we saw them on the straight, he was ahead. Yeah. So he must have been carrying another five or 10 miles an hour advantage in that part of the racetrack. That is remarkable. Wolfgang Ulrich has a look at his watch just to see how much longer this is going to last for this lead battle. Is there anything now that Werner can do? They've got another pit stop each still to come. They come down the hill towards Pouin and that would go to the left-hander. Now what's happening further up the road? There are going to be three more back markers that need negotiating. And Rene Rast, given the way that he's going now, does suggest that he's going to be able to build this lead all over again. But is there a sting in the tail for the race? As I say, there's another pit stop to come. But just suppose Rats got caught up in traffic, Dirk Werner would be right back with him. The difficulty will be the idea is just simply quicker. Forget the drivers, mm. car to car right now, the idea is the quicker car. And it would take something, I mean, really ridiculous to compromise Rene Rast at this point with the momentum he's able to carry. And you can see he's able to almost cherry pick when he catches and overtakes these back markers coming into Blanchemont and he'll be up alongside the Porsche as they come up into the braking zone and that's that's what traffic management about and also Dirk, Moore, Dirk Werner gets alongside as well so what and on some occasions you, you do you'll actually back off at a particular part of racetrack to ensure that at the part that you want to make your overtake you're in position and uh, I just wonder did René Ras do that because he managed it absolutely to perfection the way this is going to pan out, I think, is that the Audi will stop before the BMW because traditionally it makes shorter stints. So the BMW may go back into the lead on the next round of pit stops, but when it has to serve its last stop, then the Audi will go back ahead. So, as we said all along, really, it's going to come down to the last round of stops. Even were the BMW to be ahead after the last round, it would have to be driven very defensively. And you've just seen how much more speed the Audi has got to carry it through anyway. Yeah, I mean, and that's all corner speed up over and through the, well, the Eau Rouge radio part of the racetrack. I mean, it is visual, and it's visual in other parts of the racetrack as well, that uh, René Rast is so in tune with the balance of his race car. He is unquestionably the fastest driver car combination on the circuit by a substantial margin. So the gap builds as they come downhill. We are not far from starting the last hour of the race then here at Spa as René Rast works his way through the traffic, lap 496, he's now on, heading downhill, running wide out of Speaker's Corner, so-called because from the uh, old track commentary box opposite the Endurance Pits, it was the one other part of the circuit you could see, and as it didn't have a name, the Belgian commentators and the speaker decided they'd call it after themselves, so Speaker's Corner it became, and it then brings the cars down to Pouin, from which they come now to the Piff Path. There is Dirk Werner, who lost four tenths in the first 
sector of this lap. Let's have another look at how the move was made. Down to Eau Rouge, uphill. There is a gap, but by the time they get to the top of the hill... I mean, there is... The, the, both cars were absolutely almost off the racetrack, but the speed that the Audi carried from here to the beginning of the Kennel Straight, I mean, it just was like Fantastic. another gear. Absolutely. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, how it ran the, the BMW down. I've not seen any car at any point in this race be as emphatic on the exit speed that uh, we've just seen the now leading idea of René Rast. And leading and pulling away René Rast, isn't he? It was inevitable really coming down towards the bus stop once again. So as they head their way right and then left up towards the timing line, he pulled away four tenths in sector one and three tenths in sector two. It may not sound very much, but you add that together and one lap and then keep on going for another hour. It's going to be a gap and a half. Now what's this conversation all about? This is at WRT. Yes, yeah, so those are heavy-duty meetings going on there. Mm, you're right about they're not, that. They're not deciding with one spoonful or two spoonfuls. So that is the lead car. So up and up. So the progress of Rennie Rass, and there in his shadow, and he's, well, he's hanging in as the Nissan gets caught out. It's a harmless spin, but nonetheless, Alex Buncombe didn't expect Alex to do that. So it's, the gap opened up very quickly, but it's kind of sort of settled down and stabilized as, as almost a Dirk is trying to do the best he can as last lap. Pretty much was half a second slower, but compared to some of the previous laps where the gap between the cars was more than being run down by more than a second, it's difficult to tell. Let me read you the official statement that has just been presented to us regarding Marcus May, the driver of the number 111 Kessel Racing Ferrari. He has been transported to the hospital of Liège on Saturday evening. Uh, pleased to report that Marcus May is conscious now, reacts to impulses and is able to move his limbs. Mr May will remain in the expert care of the CHU of Liège for the time being. And SRO Motorsports Group would like to thank Track Marshall's safety and medical teams for their professionalism and efficiency during this edition of the Total 24 Hours of Spa. That is the official statement regarding the condition of Marcus Mai from the accident of yesterday evening. Well, that's probably about the best news I've had all weekend. Though certainly over the last 24 hours it was a, a serious incident and uh, it looked to be potentially... He didn't want to speak it. Indeed. Indeed. And it's great now. I mean, he's still in a serious condition but stabilization is the key and with the right people assisting then we'll hopefully have a recovery and uh, maybe one day we'll see him come back and race here at Spa. Because he's a good enthusiast for motor racing is Marcus Mai. nobody deserves that kind of accident at all as you look at the race leader René Rast who comes over the line is today a completely different feel from yesterday I know we've had incidents but nothing like the carnage of yesterday and the race has been what it should be it's been about racing about strategy about speed not safety cars and accidents and damage the first six hours I've never been involved in an event in which the first six hours were just nuts <laughs> and I mean that's a flippant comment to make because there were three really really serious accidents major high-speed accidents which could have led to much serious, more serious consequences. And part of the safety of the car, the safety of the circuit, the great work done by the medicals and the marshals around the racetrack, getting the drivers transported to the various areas, the locations in certain hospitals and certain locations specialize in one medical condition, others do something else. And big incident and uh, both drivers are being cared for. Just interestingly, I was given a note that uh, Vadim Kogay is, uh, he was actually readmitted this morning to Arkham, uh, uh, Arkham Hospital because he didn't feel 100%. So he is uh, in their care and uh, he will be being looked after every bit as well. Indeed so, and we look forward to welcoming both Vadim Kogay and Marcus Mai back to a block pound paddock in the not too distant future. As you look at the two race leaders with 70 minutes and change on the clock, and it looks as though it is going to be another Audi victory, but BMW, the Mark VDS team, taking the fight to Audi. It's not giving up. There you can see the third place car, Frank Stippler, who is a lap down, 
so near but yet so far. I mean, look, on the track, he's only about five and a half seconds behind as there you've got a spinning Mercedes, but with a lap between Werner and Stippler, he needs a drama to be for that car before he can pick up a place. 67 has had a spin, and that car getting going once again. Yeah, that was up at Le Croom, just over around yeah. the corner and spun round. The gap between first and second, I mean, bearing in mind the pace at which René Rast ran down the BMW, is 3.1 seconds, but there was a stage where he was taking a second and a half a lap. Yes. So has René Rast backed off, or is it just the best of the tyre is now gone, and his time, I mean, his last lap was still 1.1 seconds quicker than Kurt Werner in the second place BMW, but the gap between us now 4.1 seconds, but it's not stretching as quickly as it's been closed down. No, indeed so. Now, could be a combination of factors, as you suggest. The gap is now 4.1 seconds. It is creeping up a little bit, but as you rightly say, not massively so. No, I mean, so the, the rate at which it was being run down is yeah. greater than the rate at which it's being extended. Indeed, and I just wonder whether or not that's anything to do with those earnest conversations we saw down at WRT. Well, it would be a nice to have been a fly in the wall. That was certainly heavy duty. Yes. I mean, that was not for the public or for the media to be a party to. So I think it's time Ben went for a walk, don't you? I think I'd like to hear Ben's voice and that of maybe somebody in the ID pitch who's prepared to be open, yes. candid, and disarmingly honest about it. This is the classification. Well, don't the push your luck on that one. <laughs> well, one can but try. Four seconds it was coming over the line between Audi and BMW. Audi third a lap down. There you're looking at. 53, which is the leading Pro-Am car. Nick Homerson has now got behind the wheels. So I think they've uh, decided to let Andrea Bertolini have a little break before they throw him in for the end. And then critically, a Curia Castle have now got Alexander Sim in that car and he lapped just under two seconds quicker than the class leading car on that last lap. But that's a big ask. You know, you're looking at well, almost sector two yeah. of the racetrack in terms of gap between the leading car and the second place BMW with an hour and nine minutes to go. It is doable, but, but it's going to take a scintillating drive from another young driver in the BMW. But I don't think that the Ferrari will keep Nick Homerson into the end. I would imagine they'll put Andrea Bertolini in if they've got the opportunity to run him again. I would have thought they would put the quicker driver in at the end. If they don't, and it goes Nick Homerson to Alexander Sims to you the very agree, end, yeah. then that's a real chance. That would be a mega result for a Curia Carson for Barwell, wouldn't it? Uh, absolutely. So we need to focus on this with what have we got? 68 minutes to go. It's not over till it's over. So we wait to see when they come across the start-finish line to see actually what that gap is between the Ferrari and the BMW in the Pro Cup. There, there is third 52, place. and it's Craig Lowndes. Finally, we've seen him behind the wheel of it. Craig Lowndes is doing some work. I'm glad Craig <laughs> didn't take his overalls off about two hours ago when I last saw him. And there is the Australian legend driving the car as you'd expect, running the car right out to the edge of the racetrack. You know, not familiar with the circuit, not familiar with the, the, the electronics on a modern GT car. He just needs that little bit of time. Yeah. He's got the pace. I mean, the guy can drive anything on with four wheels on it. Probably anything with two wheels on it if he wanted to. Well, he is a great biker, you're right. So he's a big, keen bike fan. Came out of Formula Ford 1600 back home, came to Europe, was part of Helmut Marco's team in Formula 3000. It was not a happy time. He went back home and fell into a drive for the Works Factory Holden team, HRT Holden Racing team, won the Australian Touring Car Championship twice. Now very much part of the Red Bull Triple Eight effort. Five times a Bathurst 1000 winner. His fastest, his lap, that last lap was quicker than both the BMW ahead and the Ferrari leading this class. So I, I, I just don't understand why he didn't get more seat time in the car. Because he can certainly deliver. And as we've been saying during the course of the race, he has been a great asset to the event. Great with fans, great with sponsors. And a proper enthusiast as well, loves motor racing, not just him doing it, he loves the sport and everything he has about it, and the heritage of it as well. Heads uphill then, so Craig Lowndes running third in class. He is a lap down on Alexander Sims in the Acuria Cost BMW, but Skippy for the Ferrari there, with the kangaroo on the side, heads through Le Con. One of the Nissans further up the road ahead. One of the things I'm, I'd just be curious to watch, Craig Lowndes, because coming from Australia where there's very strictly enforced rules and regulations about misuse of track limits. I just wonder, is Craig still locked into that syndrome where 
you know, if you if you abuse the racetrack, you've got Tim Schenken, the race director of, of CAMS, on your case. Well, he's certainly using the racetrack here coming down the hill. So maybe he's put those uh, notions behind him as he gets into Pujo. The gap between leading Ferrari and second base BMW, the last time I came across the lap was 42.3 seconds with an hour and five, an hour and five minutes to go. It's a big ass. It is, isn't it? It's a big it amount of time. It's going to take again, you know, somebody getting tripped over traffic or something that is going to give you that little bit of a lift. Just going back to Craig Lowndes and Trackman, it's one of the things, of course, that V8 Supercars has done for many, many years is take the racing to the people, and therefore there are a huge amount of street races in Australia. Circuits come and go quite regularly, but probably the bulk of the calendar these days, it feels, is on street circuits. And Bathurst, effectively, is public roads where there are concrete walls on either side, so you've got to be pretty sharp to know not to hit the concrete. Maybe that's standing him in good stead. You've been to Adelaide, mate? I have. Adelaide is a great racetrack, mate. Great Same. for supercars, super V8s. Oh, I mean, absolutely. they uh, talk about hitting concrete. They are concrete eaters in that particular race. And the Gold Coast as well at Surface Paradise. I think it was David Brabham that moved the concrete back there when he was uh, there two or three years ago. Did quite a bit of damage to his Ford. But street circuits are the go down under. Over the line goes Craig Lowndes. And he is lapping in the 224s. He's the quicker of the top three in the class. Absolutely. Still, he's going yeah, strongly. Second consecutive lap yeah. that he's done so. This is the Gentleman Trophy class leading Ferrari. This has gone, he says, touching wood, like clockwork. This metronomic Ferrari, handled at the moment by Francisco Guedes. It's an AF course of Ferrari, so what else do you expect? The other a car will go strongly. And if you take the, the, the cars in, in the Pro Cup against the cars in the Gentleman Cup, identical cars essentially, mm. but the difference between the quickest Ferrari right now, Craig Lyons, and this car is four seconds a lap, which is not the car. That's no. the difference between a Gentleman driver and a full-on professional, fully paid-up driver. And that's the second car in the Gentleman Trophy. Leo Machitsky has got back into the Team Parker Racing Audi. And again, this is a private team, but with the uh, Audi Customer Racing Programme, as it's called. They have access to the parts, to the knowledge, to the data, and uh, Audi keen that its customers are looked after. So Team Parker Racing, Stuart Parker's squad, running this car. Leo Machitsky, who's normally to be found in the Curia Cost Barwell set up, certainly the Barwell element of, of the BMW operation it runs in the ELMS. Uh, he's driving the Audi this weekend and he comes down towards Bruxelles now. He got about three laps in last week at the Red Bull ring before he got turfed into a spin and the car was damaged, so this has been a much happier race for Leo Machitsky. And then third of the Gentleman Trophy, Porsche. Another powwow with all the heavy hitters in Audi. Vas on Vas, Pierre Dudonne, I think it's Thierry Tassa in there. There are some smiles though. Totally doom and gloom, I wouldn't have thought that. It's strange that they're sort of all congregating in the back of the pits, and... Uh... There might be more to come, there might be more to come. Uh, we've got Greg Gilbert running in fourth place in the pits, as you look at number 49, the AF Corsa Ferrari. Is it Yannick Malagol at the wheel? It is, and it's got the spare door on the car, as you can tell. The red door, after the damage sustained early on. There he goes. So they've got the number panel on, but the wrong door. But at least the car is still in the race. And third in class for uh, Yannick Malagol, along with Jean-Marc Bachelier, Howard Black, and Francois Perodo, the oil and gas exploration company owner. Both Bachelier and Malagol. Is that shale or just regular gas? <laughs> bit, of t bit of real estate in parts of Northern Europe that might be of interest to him. <laughs> Listen, if it funds his racing, I think he'll go anywhere for it. So, 62 minutes of the race remain. And there's 75 Audi, another from the customer programme. That's the ISR car that Sir Philip Salaquado was driving early on. Indeed, has got back into now Salaquado, Basang, uh, and Fabian Hamprecht, the drivers. Yeah, I mean, again, a car that's almost been invisible throughout the yeah. weekend. We've never found it in a, in a group of cars, it's never sort of stood out on performance alone. And uh, it's just sort of been slipping and sliding around. Just inside and outside the top ten, currently in 17th, of Philippe Salaquada, which is a disappointment, I would have said. Lead gap coming up on the screen as soon as the second place car goes through the sector, 7.9 seconds. It is creeping up a little bit, but 7.9 is not a colossal deficit. It's not. I, know. I mean, the, it, it, 
it, it has been stretching, but as I mentioned, the gap from the, the catch to the stretch is, is being reduced. It's certainly not over yet. Whoops, 75 spins. Philip Salacuada loses it going into the bus stop. It's almost like he tried to measure his pace against Rene Rast and discovered it wasn't going to happen. So uh, 75 goes around and back on track. The ISR Audi rejoins the race. A little bit of time loss. Heads over the line. So here's the replay. Then maybe his focus was not on what he was doing and where he was. I mean, for sure, Rene Rast, this is where he is really also outstanding the car he gets the car in uses the curb stays on the right then gets a good cut back to the left to get the car a good run off so Rene Rast Dirk Werner the two leading cars are on the same lap Frank Stiffler third is one lap down as we are about to break into the last hour of the total 24 hours of Spa Pro-Am leader versus pro leader here because Nick Homerson, who is 38.7 seconds ahead of opposition Alexander Sims, is about to be lapped by number one Rene Rast up on the inside line there. Yeah, it was 42 seconds, what, three, four laps ago? So it's coming down and technically if both drivers were to stay in the car until the end then it would be very conceivable that Alexander Sim would put the BMW into a challenging position. He may not take the lead of that category, but capable of certainly challenging for it. But whether the Ferrari opt to keep the current driver and uh, revert back to uh, Andrea Bertolini, Mr. Ferrari, employ me and I'll drive you in the car anywhere, as long as it's a Ferrari. Or a Maserati at some time. Yes, they put him on loan, didn't they, for yeah. a time to yeah. Michael Bartels, Vita right. for one and Vitaphone teams to go and race Maserati MC12s. Rene Rast, it's not that long ago that he was the Volkswagen Polo Cup champion. How things have improved for him with Porsches and now Audi R8s to go racing in. Working his way up towards the bus stop then. Eight seconds he is ahead of Dirk Werner. And of course now he's in a rhythm. He can afford to uh, take these laps at a decent pace. Let's see what we can learn from Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich in the pits with Ben Constantiorus. Dr. Ulrich, we've seen uh, some smiles and some happy times and some interesting discussions down here at Audi recently. Uh, everything okay for the last hour of this race? I mean, this is a really challenging race and it is very, very tight with the BMW number 77. They are very, very strong for a long, long period of time. Yeah, and uh, if you look at what probably is going to come, if things run normally, it will be very tight to the very end. So what are you expecting then from, from the Audi side of things in the last hour? Surely just one stop and that's it? Yeah, everybody has one stop and that's it. But the question is, what are you doing and what are you not doing at this stop? OK, Dr. Eric, thank you very much. Thank you. That was telling them, wasn't it? Well, we know they don't have to do discs and pads on the Audi. Do they have to do anything else on the BMW? Is there anything else that can be done or needs to be done on the Audi that we've not considered yet? It's difficult to imagine them I in mean, discs, pads, or the, the major components that have to be changed. So, uh, other than you have a fresh set of tyres, driver change, and, or keep Rene Rast in, whatever you choose. Let's have another look at the highlights of what has been a very eventful 24 hours of Spa with the grid formed in front of packed grandstands. Felix Baumgartner was the man, the space diver, who waved them away at 4.25 yesterday for the 4.30 start as the cars came over the line. The race underway, uh, the field accelerated down towards Arouge with Laurence Vantour taking the lead and Daniel Zampieri having an early spin. Nick Katzberg was tagged by Stefan Mucker and he went off the road and early damage for the steering of Bentley 8, put it into the garage. Pierre Hershey had a spin in the Ferrari, Marco Ciocci's Ferrari had a puncture and he had to go for the pit lane as well. The pit lane was busy very early indeed. There's some great battles raged on on track. Bentley versus Audi. Audi going ahead. Kevin Est had to stop in the McLaren and change a fuse. Then he got back to the team to do some more work on the car as we had Katsumasa Chio punted into a spin and some rather nervous faces as the pit lane became even busier. Martin Ragginger's Porsche with a liquid leak spun on the fluid and Randy went off the road. Dirk Werner was trying to work his way through traffic, but the traffic was not helping. Bass Linders was very concerned. He was especially worried about the way that Olivier Grutz was driving in the McLaren. For a whole lap, virtually, he held up Dirk Werner, squeezing him up onto the kerb. 
that certainly cost the BMW time. And then we have the first of the major accidents of the evening. The SMP Racing Ferrari off the road, just avoided by Alex Buncombe. Marshalls had to move the car, clear the track, and just as we went green, we went yellow. Tim Mullen off the road in the Von Ryan Racing McLaren. More pit stops undertaken as people dived into the pit lane. We went green, we went yellow. Karim Auger off the circuit at the top of Radion. That was an incident that had to be attended to. The McLaren was out of the race, and as the safety car was deployed yet again, Jürgen Muller put 66 BMW right up to the back of the Giacomo Puccini-driven Ferrari. We went green, we went yellow again. This time, Andrew Danilov spun and was hit very hard by Andrew Howard. Others just ploughed into the wreckage. At the end of the safety car period, there was a green and a yellow flag. That confused Rene Raff, so understandably, he had a slow run to make sure he wasn't deemed to have gained any advantage. Steve Earle's Ferrari had suspension damage after being tagged into this spin, but he dragged the car back. Sadly, it would retire soon afterwards in a different incident. Jörg Muller's car repaired, went back into the race, but later would serve a drive-through penalty for causing that collision. And Alexei Vasilyev's McLaren went off the road with the Ferrari of Alessandro Bonaccini. More yellow flags flew. Marcus May and also Vadim Kurgai off the road at Blanchimont. And Marcus May needing to be airlifted to hospital caused the race to be suspended. A red flag and the car stopped on the circuit. But under the red flag, number three Audi made a pit stop. That's okay, said the officials, but for it, you're going to have to serve a drive-through penalty. Not to incur any more penalties, the team elected to do further work once the safety car moved away and the race was ready for a restart. The tyres went on and the car was dropped down and it rejoined the race. The drive-through was served behind the safety car. That was not in the regulations. It had to be under green flag conditions and so the car came back in. It ultimately lost two minutes and Christopher Meese dropped down to third place. When the race went live once again, it was still a battle amongst the Audis at the front of the field. And the teams were set for a very long and arduous night on track. Christopher Meese with the Audi sparked his way through Eau Rouge. And the cars accelerated their way into the darkness as the fans had the disco and the funfair and the concerts and the fireworks and the beer and the free to more beer to distract them going through the nighttime section of the race. The teams battled on through to dawn. And as bleary-eyed fans came out of their tents, they saw that 77 BMW led the way, and there was a three-wheeled Ferrari as number 42 Lorenzo Bontempelli shed a wheel. Marshall found the wheel nut, Bontempelli found the team. The fans were ready for their breakfast and ready for the continuation of the battle, with 77 BMW making a pit stop, and in the early hours of Sunday, discs and pads being changed across Audis and BMWs was a factor of the lead situation, with the gap shuffling accordingly. Down in the pit lane, though, others just wanted to catch up on some rather much-needed sleep. Rene Ras pounded on and almost got collected as he tried to lap Nigel Farmer in the Mercedes. He got away with it, though. But everybody was focusing on the action, with the Bentleys going strongly. But then Claude Goslar brought out the safety car, the XF3000 racer, spinning and headbutting the wall, coming out of Blanchimont. Santelok officials were busy chatting to engineers, and we had Nissans back in with punctures and Black Falcon Mercedes discs alight. Number three Audi very nearly got squeezed out of contention. There was another punctured Ferrari into the pit lane. Came 350 with Leonardo Gorini at the wheel. But on track, the battle was very much now between Mark VDS and WRT as Harold Primack got aboard 84 and tangled with Michael Meadows, whose Aston had to pit. Rene Rast's car, shared by Lawrence Vantor and Marcus Winkelhock, rumbled its way back into the race. As yet another puncture for number 35 Nissan delayed it. The Bentley, number seven, had to have the floor fixed. That was a long stop for that car. And then Cedric Mezard slithered off the road with his Ferrari. He wasn't the only one in strife as the number 18 Mercedes had a puncture. And then number two Audi was clobbered by Adam Christodoulou, who turned in on Benoit Trellier. The gap was coming down between the leaders. Dirk Werner's car being caught by the number one Audi. 77 BMW. Losing time, losing time, and eventually Lucas Lure at the wheel. It was passed for the race lead as thundering through came the number one Audi. The opposition losing touch with the top two. Stefano Comandini's BMW off the road, and up front, number one Audi continuing to lead the way. And despite the optimism of we're going to win from Mark VDS Racing, the car briefly went a lap down as the Audi R8 went on by. 
But then at the next pit stop, it had to do for the second time, discs and pads. And that cost the car a chunk of time that brought the BMW back into the equation. Others were still trying to get back into the race, such as the Leno AMR. Aston Martin was number one, went for the discs and the pads to be sorted out. So the gap in real terms came down between it and the 77 BMW that by now was struggling with an ABS problem. Richard Muscat's car had rear damage as well after contact. He was heading for the pit lane. On track, Werner lost the lead as charging past him came an inspired Rene Rast. It was a great move and it was a very popular one down in the Audi garage. Even Bas Linders had to look appreciative. As the Audis then turn their way out of La Source, we have car number one leading the way with now 50 minutes of the race to go. Number one, Rene Rast he says that he turns his way downhill and I think now the gap is up to 10.6 seconds. It's creeping up but the BMW is still there or thereabouts. It can't totally be discounted. No, not at all. I mean, and, and you still have a joker on the pack when it comes to the, the final round of pit stops. There could always be an issue. Something goes wrong. It is ever so simple. And even with 50 minutes of this race remaining, stranger things have happened. But it's been an outstanding these last stints that we've seen Rene Rast in the Audi. I've not seen anybody drive with the fluidity and the absolute, you know, it's a pleasure to watch a professional driver taking a car and driving it in that manner. And at no point has he ever looked flustered, has he ever looked rushed. Everything is happening, it's just, he's got so much time within himself and therefore within the car, that whatever he's doing, we think he's driving on the ragged edge on the limit. For him, it's just simply like a nice Sunday afternoon drive in the Ardennes Forest. We happen to be in a race. And the beauty is, as one of the Ferraris runs very wide coming through at Belongement, the beauty is that he's taken control of this race. The gap at the last lap was 10.6 seconds. And that's going to be extended. Now, which Ferrari is that? It's not Ferrari, not the 50, 30, uh, 53 car. Didn't get a glimpse of that number. But anyway, the lead car comes across start-finish line. And we now start the clock to see how far behind Dirk Werner has fallen on this lap. And it was nine points. It's not. It was 12.10.6. Now 12.1. So again, Rene Rash is just well, pleasure to watch. Pleasure he to is, commentate on. He is. He is. I mean, watch just the positioning of the car, the attitude of the car to the apex. Everything he's doing. To me, if you wanted to take a masterclass on how to drive a GT car. Take a lap of this car, driven by Rennie Rast, and give it to anybody who's an aspiring race driver. So he comes up towards Les Combes then, with, as you say, 12 seconds over Dirk Vander. We have uh, now heard from Volkan Gulrich about Audi matters. What about BMW? Bas Linders is now with Ben. Baz, with just under an hour left, one more pit stop to do for both you and Audi. What can you do as it looks like the car is a little bit slower on track? Well, yeah, there's not much, much we can do. Uh, I mean, uh, we push uh, as much as we can, uh, but uh, twice we were in front, but we were not able to hold position. So uh, it's, uh, there's only so much we can do uh, as a driver and as a team, and uh, we're doing uh, the maximum at the moment. Is there any value in uh, stopping and not changing tyres? Um, maybe yes, but okay, uh, it is starting to be quite hot also, and degradation of the Pirelli tyres is always quite high uh, there's also some debris on track so also risk of uh, cutting tires having a puncture so it's uh, it's always a risk uh, going one way or the other and when do we expect to see your car in uh, well um, as late as possible um, within the 65 minute window thanks very much so this 65 minute stint at the end of which because that's the maximum uh, stint time allowed, then the car will come in and then run to the end, probably in both cases, of course, they'll run to the end of the 65 minutes. We're getting a look here in replay at the Nissan, yet again a tyre. Yeah. What is it, John, with Nissans and tyres? Well, I don't know, and again, it's that left rear tyre, and again, it's early in, well, this is where we're seeing it, and in fact, the whole carcass of the tyre now is departed down at Fania, and it's again that left rear. Yeah. Now, is there something that's maybe under load, the tyre is getting caught 
by a part of the suspension or maybe a body rub or something. It just seems improbable that one car, particularly on the left side, is consistently having tyres going down. Very, very strange. It's the sister car this time. It's 80 Alex Bunker with the wheel of it. As you see, 77 BMW then turn its way out of La Source. The gap is now 13 seconds. Having been saying the gap wasn't shooting up, the last two or three laps, it does seem to have gone up by bigger chunks. Yeah, it's going up by about 1.7 to 2 seconds per lap. So... Let's just quickly go to the pits. Ben has more news. Yeah, David, remember on Friday when we went out to Eau Rouge and we were watching the cars under compression going up that fantastic hill? And oh, I do. I had the opportunity <laughs> to watch that. Do you not remember how compressed the Nissan was, both on the front and rear left side of the car? It's a fair I point, wonder that. whether that, that might be causing all these issues. It's the same. Both cars have had the same issue, and there was a lot of smoke that pours off those tyres as they go under compression through that corner. Good spot. Yes, I think you're right about that, Ben. Thinking back, we did spot that. We did talk about it together, didn't we? Yes. Good thought. I didn't see that, but that was my conclusion. Mm. So, it all adds up. Excellent. Teamwork. Well done. <laughs> WRT are ready for a pit stop. We've just seen the guys getting the tyres ready. So, number one potentially is going to be in this time. Of course, you can't go to the pit apron unless it is the lap before the car comes in. So, there we are ready. And Marcus Winkelhock will take the lead Audi to the finish of this race. And that finish could be the podium, yep. the centre spot of the podium. It would be massively disappointing to everybody in the Audi team if it wasn't going to be the centre of the podium. It's half expected they might give the last stick to Lawrence Van Tour on home soil. I, I, well, I mean, Lawrence had been sitting in the, in the gallery. We saw him sitting there in his road balls. I saw him at lunchtime in his cities. Mm. Curious, curious. Unless, of course, he's done so much of the driving early on in the race well, that they can't now a, use him again. He may have done an awful lot of driving in the nighttime hours yeah. and therefore he'd sort of run out of seat time. But look again, this is the trouble. You've got to be so cautious and... Going around the outside, can he make the cut back? Oof. That was a risk, an unnecessary yeah. risk. And that's the only thing I've seen Rene Ras do that I would have said, oh, wow, that you could have just backed off and lost a second and you know, you'd have been safe. That was not being safe. Yeah, because it wouldn't have cost him very much, would it? A second well, is nothing at all, really. The, I know the no. BM's catching or chasing, and, but and, even so. And the reason I'm making the comment is because he didn't have control over what the other car was going to do. And that, that, to me, was always the key, is being sure you know what the other car is going to do. He couldn't predict what that other car that he cut across the front of might end up doing. So in comes Audi number one then, and door opens. Is Renner Russ going to get out? Well, I think this might be a case of, do you want to stay in, are you OK? Renner Russ says, I'm all right, thanks. Well, these cars do get hot inside. There's a limited amount of ventilation, so it looks to me as if Rennie Rass has decided he wants to take this car to the checker, and uh, Marcus Winkelhock all prepared to get in. It's not a decision, really, between the two drivers, it's a team decision, but Marcus is there in the event that uh, Rennie Rass decides he's going to get out, but he's going to stay in, he's got a drinks bottle in his hand, rehydrate, and uh, there should be a drinks bottle inside the car as well. So, of course, now this puts 77 back into the lead of the race, but it will change back again, potentially on the pit stop, unless it is a slow stop from Audi number one, and there's no reason to suggest it was, because it's had new tyres put on and everything seemed to go uh, as routine as possible and as normal, and the car is back on track. So, downhill goes Dirk Werner. We're getting more and more people still being warned about track limits. It's constant. A message line on the screen about track limits. The leader goes through traffic. Martin Ragging as Porsche, 188 is behind. Former winner, 26 that Porsche is. Back on track is about to go number one, Rally Rass. He's making his way down the pit lane at the moment. There he is, still not got to pit out. The white line you will see just ahead of that black and red Mercedes there in a moment is the point at which you can accelerate. They do so now. So out of Eau Rouge, but on the inside, and therefore still in effectively the pit lane. And then the car sort of deviated a little bit to keep out of the way of the racing line on the exit of Eau Rouge. Up Radion, and then back on track. So Rennie Rast rejoins as the race leader is uh, making his way 77 down to the bus stop and heading up then towards the timing line once more. 
Andrea Bertolini coming through as we've got the Nick Homerson Ferrari with Alexander Sims now thundering on behind him. Over the line goes Nick Homerson. Alexander Sims, though, I think has lost a lap somewhere. He has. So he's dropped a lap after his last pit stop. But the Ferrari may have to make another one. They'll separate by only six seconds on the track, but yeah. one has done 503 laps, the other has done 502. So that was a sort of a, a momentary shock when I saw the gap had closed down to 6.6 .6 seconds. But as you point out, there's been a, a driver change, and that's where the lap has been lost. But Ferrari will no doubt have to bring in their car, and it'll be interesting to see what the gap. And there is the BMW making its way back down the pit lane. So they've had fuel, but not tyres, we're being told. On 77 BMW, they've rolled That's the dice and tried to gamble. double stint the tyres. That is a big gamble. It could be a race-winning move. It could be real egg on face. Now, let's see. What was the time you reckoned for a tyre change? 30 seconds? Uh, 22. 22 seconds? Yeah. I mean, that cool. is... that is. I mean, I suppose if you've got nothing else to roll, that's the dice you've got in your hands. And if they lose the lead, well, the car can always come in and have tyres because it's a lap up on the next one. So yeah. it's worth it's worth that's a punt. It's a good gamble. It's, it's a good, worth it's, a punt. It's, it's, a, it's a good punt. It's not going to be a big gap. I mean, even if it saved 22 seconds, it had lost 12, 13. So in real terms, it's only gained sort of what nine or ten net back. But here you go, the number one Audi with 40 minutes to run comes into the bus stop. It's going to be a good finish, isn't it, to what has been one heck of a race. Well, Rene Rash with fresh rubber on the car. He's up to operating temperature, literally. Is Look at Baz Lander sitting on the pit wall. He's going to enjoy these final 39 minutes and 50 seconds. Well, it's going to be... I don't know. I mean, I think maybe... I wonder how the Audi have reacted to that. Have they been maybe slightly... Wrong-footed? Yeah. Yeah, you could be right, actually. I mean, as I say, there's not a huge gap. I still think that on fresher rubber, Rene Rass will catch and pass. Yeah. But it's worth a go. That's certainly worth a go. And there is Dr Ulrich. And I wonder, did he have that particular issue programmed into his uh, very considerable brain power? And uh, I wonder, are they assuming that they're just going to change tyres and go? Mm. But 22 seconds is uh, something that would be very difficult to make up on the racetrack. And it's almost a free pass, and as you pointed out. If it doesn't work, they're still sufficient ahead of third place Christopher Meese to still come in. Make the pit stop, put it on the fresh rubber, and go back. It just means that the gap between they and the lead car, which would in those days, at that time, be the Audi, would be even greater than it is going to be. Indeed, indeed. So, so 38 three quarter minutes to go. We'll see what the gap is in real terms at the end of this lap. But there is Dirk Werner. So he's got a car with Gammy ABS, and he's on old tyres. Yeah. Okay. Lucas Law looks a bit nervous about this. Dirk Werner has got pressure piled upon him because it's not just a race that he wants to win for BMW. Of course, this is a Belgian team at a Belgian event, and it's overdue a win, Mark VDS. It's come so, so close, and this, even in these last few minutes, could still get away from it, but they're going to have a go. So Dirk Werner trying to look after the tyres versus this car, number one Audi. Well, we will soon know the gap, because the Audi is now making its way back up the long climb from Stavolo, or Campus Curve, as it's now called. Coming up into Blanchemont, the lights flashing at the BMW ahead to warn. Over the timing line comes Werner. Let's catch up on what his co-drivers think. Let's hear from Lucas Lohr now with Ben. Uh, Lucas, just a quick word from you. What's it like to drive these cars on the, the second stint of tyres, driving on old rubber? Well, we are about to find out, won't we? Have you got experience? A little bit. Uh, we tried some in the practice. Now we see if it pays out. And how was the car on uh, a second stint? Can the tyres last an hour and a half? <laughs> I said we're about to find out. Well, we, I, we don't know. Uh, but, you know, uh, we, had slight, we have slight problems with our car. That's why we cannot go the, the pace from the Audi. So, um, you know, we got to try. Uh, and when was this decision taken to try and uh, have a go at this? Was it a quite a late decision? Two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's late. I think that is late. And I wonder how much of that was Dirk Werner saying, I'll, I'll give it a go. And how much was Bas Linder saying, you will give it a go. Well, and ultimately, it doesn't matter what the decision, who made the decision or how it was reached. The fact is, it's a collective decision by the team. And win with the team or you lose with the team. And you put a big 
onus on the hands of Derek Werner because he's going to have to drive a car with a set of rubber that's done the best part of an hour already and he's now got to finish the 36 minutes of this race knowing that he hasn't got the out and out pace but what he's got and that's the, the, the benefit that they've chosen to go for they've got track position the gap well, is 20.8 seconds I think between first and second with 36 minutes I mean it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when the idea will catch up and then once again retake the lead but it was the best shot that BMW yeah. had left in their whole uh, range of, of options but you never know if a bit of traffic gets in the way and interrupts the rast progress and it just is, is that stay of execution for the BMW then you know that can all help equally the traffic can get in the way of Werner that will help the Audi so with 36 minutes and counting still to go it's on it's a, it's, it's a, it was a gamble, it was a good gamble to take. The reality is it, it, it's not going to work because Rene Rast right now is driving like a man possessed in yeah. a car that is functioning fully within its uh, design specification. The BMW has got an issue with its traction control and also the ABS, the sensor, have gone down. So they're having to struggle with that and adapt and adjust. Here's a car and driver that are perfectly in tune with one another. And that's the reason why I suspect Rene Rast wasn't keen to vacate the seat he's done an absolutely incredible job this afternoon and he wants the glory we're hearing as well from the pits that that last stop from WRT was by normal standards a bit leisurely like you know four or five seconds slightly slower because perhaps they were expecting uh, with the car in the lead and VDS to have to change tyres as well that they were in the box seat but by not changing tyres they have been wrong footed as we spoke about a moment ago in context of Wolfgang Ulrich and so what was a moderately leisurely stop we put it that way uh, now well it's not come back to haunt them because the gap's down to 17 seconds anyway but it has given them just a little bit more work to do than they expected they probably thought after the final stop for the BMW they'd still be ahead now they're having yeah. to play catch up so again now they're doing the whole thing all over again so it means that Rene Rast has got a charge. Last lap he did was a 2.22 against uh, Dirk Averno's time of a 2.25. Again, most likely traffic influenced. So that's where the, the reduction in lap time is coming there. You can see one lap, 0.2 of a second of improvement. Following lap, 2.9 seconds, almost three seconds from the, the, the lap time of Dirk Averno. So one back marker ahead, and how many cars are there? One, two, three, four back markers between the top two at the moment. Just over half an hour of the race remaining. So the way that the gap is coming down, they're going to be together with round about 10 minutes to go, and that is going to be about the last four laps of the race. So it's going to be a really good finish. You know, people talk about the good old days of Spa 24 in the 60s and the 70s. The racing was all over before it got dark, yes. and there was a, later a 16-hour cruise, maybe even longer, an 18-hour cruise. Today, this is a 24-hour sprint event. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely flat out from the... Well, we saw that in the first six hours. It was well over the top. But that's what you're going to get. You've got a, a big field of cars, even on a long circuit like this, seven kilometres in length. And it caused major issues. Uh, now the racetrack a lot more clear and uh, Rennie Rass is able to, to run at the pace there is the lead BMW coming up into the source and where is the Audi where are the lights there it is coming out of the bus stop yes we're making the good old days now aren't we uh, because this is the era that people are going to talk about in the future as to how competitive GT racing particularly in the Spa 24 hours has been so one back marker if you can call the sixth the fifth place car rather a back marker Jasmine Jafar just lapped by the charging Rene Rass that car is four laps down now the Mercedes and that's a competitive car, that's yeah. the car that won this race last year. Indeed so. Ah, uh, but they had the ingredient. The Schneider the, factor. They had <laughs> the ingredient. The other great driver here among... Oh, and the Aston, is that just coming out of the pits? Yeah. Wow, that just when you see a group of cars, I just think, oh no, not again. In all those dramas we had at Radion yesterday, I know they were on restarts, but weren't we lucky that there was nobody coming out of the pits at the same time as cars cannon off into those tyres? Don't even think about it. I mean, there were bits of cars, yeah. suspension components, wheels, goodness knows whatever else. We didn't get to see in detail what it was, but there are lumps of cars, substantial lumps of cars, flying, yeah. Yeah. flying, probably 100 metres or more before it came into contact with the barrier and uh, came safely to rest. The gap is 15.2 seconds. We have got 31 minutes to go. The gap is down by 0.8 of a second in sector one. It needs something to go wrong for Rast, doesn't it? 
rather than anything Dirk Werner can do. He can't really risk going any faster with this ABS problem. And of course, on a set of tyres that's past its best. But as we keep saying, it's worth a roll of the dice. All you got, all you got left in your your game of uh, strategy. And his lap time, last lap time, 2.24. René Rast, 2.21. So two back markers, Dirk Werner goes to the inside of the Ferrari, there is Rast, who's also sorting out traffic, of course. In the first sector, he was eight-tenths quicker. I'll tell you what the second sector time is in a moment when it gets to the timing beam. Much quicker, by over a second, 1.3 seconds faster. So as you said a couple of laps ago, it's when, not if. Oh, yeah. But for how much longer, with the race with half an hour to go, how long can Dirk Werner hang on in there? There he is, through the bus stop. I mean, just looking at the car, it's not doing anything that looks uncomfortable or bad. No. It's just the, the grip, the tyre has gone past the peak of its performance and uh, it isn't going to get any better. So down to La Source he comes. One, two, three, four back markers and a bit of real estate between him and René Rast. Over the line comes then number one, René Rast. We thought the car was going to be given over to Marcus Winkelhock. We were wrong. Let's find out what happened. So, Marcus, you were ready to get in the Audi, but then uh, they left um, they left Rast in the car. Uh, no, I just have to wear my helmet and my overall to give him the drink bottle, that's why. Ah, OK, right. Um, were you expecting BMW to do what they did in terms of um, not changing tyres? Um, to be honest, no. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think it's going to end up in a really, really close finish uh, today. René is on a good pace, and they have, because of the used tyres, uh, for, for sure a disadvantage, lap time wise, and uh, as I said, for sure it's going to be close like this. And what's the, um, uh, what's the idea um, in terms of how the tyres will last over the 65 minutes? Can, are they still okay using them for an hour and a half? Um, yeah, you, for sure you can feel after 60 minutes uh, that there's quite a big drop, especially the last couple of laps, like three, four laps before you come into the pit lane, you, you feel, feel a drop on the rear, especially. And uh, <clears throat> for sure the BMW uh, will have the same. And if you go half an hour longer, um, we never tried that out, so uh, they will see probably. I think they, they uh, don't know themselves what's, what's going on with the tyre. And you've informed René that that's been the situation? Sorry? Have you told René in the car that the BMW is on all the tyres? Uh, yeah, of course. He knows that. Uh, he knows about the situation, about the gap between the cars, everything. So, But he's doing a great job in the moment. The pace is really good. And yeah, the only thing I can do now is... Uh, and how is he feeling in the car? Is he under pressure or quite cool? Uh, he's quite cool. Uh, he felt okay. He asked me how long to go. I said 40 minutes. And he said, yeah, okay, everything is fine. I'm going to push. And then I closed the door and said, good luck. All right, thanks very much. So there, you can see once again the uh, replay of Marcus Winkelhock helmet and overalls going to the car. And under the regulations, if you're going to be on a pit apron, you yeah. have to wear overalls and a crash helmet. Yeah. So that explains why we saw that. But he was there in the event if René Rast wanted to get out of the car, rather than have René Rast get out and then have Mark, or Marcus having to run around. So he was there and it served two purposes. The gap is 9.6 seconds. 28 minutes counting remaining. So how many more laps before we see the lead switch over once again? Dirk Werner wasn't really able to repel the Audi last time and I suspect it's going to be a walk in the park for René Rast to get through. But Dirk Werner's not going to go down fighting, is he? They've come so close to a win. And with 27 and a half minutes and a flying lap at the moment is a 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, around that margin, depending on which car, which lap. And work out from there how many more laps we're going to get. It's not that many more as the leading car heads down towards Bruxelles. René Rast in his second place down. He's got more traffic to worry about. And again, very early, he's on the headlights. Flash, flash, flash to try and persuade them to bail out of the way for him. Yeah, I mean, he, he just wants to get the clearest run at every corner and clearest run off every corner. He doesn't mind doing a bit of overtaking in the straight parts of the racetrack. That's not going to have any effect, but this, for example, coming down the hill here into Pujol, he'll be held up. The Ferrari's committed to its line. There's no way you can really go around the outside and to try and force a car driven by one of the gentleman drivers 
uh, be harsh on him would uh, again be something that you shouldn't be doing. So the race leaders work their way for the 516th time down through Piff Path and then to campus number one there Rene Rast in sector one was nearly a second faster so he really is well fired up isn't he he's hacking away into this margin and once he's ahead of course he can then slacken the pace a little bit perhaps like we saw last time because he carved his way onto the tail of Dirk Van got past and was then able to relax his pace just a little Dirk Van though hanging on in there we've got 26 minutes to go there's the leading car into the bus stop once again Yes, and the gap, 9.6 at the last time of calling. That was at the end of lap 515 as they come across the line. Now to end 516. So what has René Rast managed to claw out of that advantage? Uh, 6.7 seconds. So, again, the best part of two and a half seconds. And he dives up the inside there. I know it's an Audi that he's getting past, but even so, that was very late on the brakes to make sure that he doesn't lose a split second against Dirk Werner. And Bas Leinders, with resignation, I think, now looks on. It was a good gamble, but there's just going to be too much time in the race for that car to be able to hang on, isn't there? Yes, I mean, it's just a matter of, he said, it's going to be, well, within the next five to eight minutes, René Rass is going to be on the gearbox or under the rear wing, certainly of this car coming down into Le Groom, the leading BMW. And then there will be maybe a bit of a skirmish as to whether... They give it up as easily as we saw them do much earlier in the, in the event when uh, the leader Audi came up to pass what was then the leading BMW. So this time it's for real. This time it's for the difference between winning and being the first of the losers. Which nobody will ever remember. People only remember winners, oh, don't they? In Belgium they'll remember. They'll remember a valiant fight. Yeah. If it is to be the Team VDS uh, BMW that might finish in second place. And it's going to be Belgian teams, first, second and third, isn't it? Because it will be potentially WRT, VDS, WRT, the Belgian Audi club, but Team WRT. But we are not yet at an Audi in the lead. It's still this BMW. It may be on borrowed time. There is the charging Rene Rast. So he's got the quicker car anyway, and then he's catching a car on old tyres. It doesn't really give Dirk Werner very much to battle again, battle with, does it? It's like having one arm tied behind his back and, and he's being and caught. Just, just been watching coming through Fania. I mean, René Rast actually isn't driving the car right on the outside edge of its, of its limit. He's just driving it sensibly. He's got natural speed. He's got the benefit of a second and a half, probably on average, uh, in hand over the, the lead BMW. And there's 23 minutes and there's 6.7 seconds at the last time over the start-finish line. You know, nice try, Baz. Yeah, and both team principals, Dr. Ulrich and Audi and, and Baz Linders. I mean, this has been a, 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 an absolutely brilliant game of cat and mouse between, yeah. in a way, the very large uh, WRT Audi operation. The very large cat. Well, and, and the, the much smaller Mark VDS yeah. team. I mean, there's Audis all through the field in every category, but the Mark VDS team had two cars entered, one got taken out because of a rabbit, and that will be off the menu tonight, I'm sure. <laughs> so, there we go. But have a look in the Audi garage, and you see Audi factory drivers, you see BMW factory drivers at Mark VDS, you see Audi personnel, you see Mark VDS personnel. Audi as a company seems to take more interest in this than BMW does. There's more Audi presence at WRT, whereas Mark VDS still feels like a private team taking on a manufacturer. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's very much what it is, and Audi have developed the Audi R8, the V10 version of it that we see here, and it's, it's in different guises for different markets and different championships around the world. And they've, they've built on that and they've had enormous success. Whereas BMW's Z4M program is a factory program in North America, where that's where they expect to sell the majority of their Z4Ms or Z4 versions. Uh, so that's their priority, along with other areas of motorsport, principally DTM, which they're heavily involved in. You know, this is an area where they've got a, they have a very competitive car. Sadly, we've got a small issue with the, the sensor on board and we're not getting the true pace from the leading BMW that we know is there. That car was on pace pretty much with anything else in the field. And now the gap is you know, it's just the exit of Pujol as the BMW goes into Fania. 21 minutes to go and the gap was five seconds across the line. It'll be down to probably four and a little bit or maybe even below. Even less, maybe three and a half, yeah. 
Well, number two out, he just quickly to catch up on other things. His 12th, Benoit Trellier, is back at the wheel of it, having been up here with us, and he is being warned about respecting the track limits as the Audi management, the screens and the engineers up and down the pit lane can only now sit and watch. They've done all they can. But there is a battle that could change on the closing laps. That's the battle for the Pro-Am between the leading Ferrari and the second place BMW. The gap now is 23 seconds and we've got 21 minutes. Alexander Sim, last lap was just under three seconds a lap quicker. So that's a battle that's going to be interesting because that could see uh, a swap around yeah. in the closing laps. Yeah, Sims is flying again, isn't he, in the Barwell 23.6 in his BMW. last lap. Yeah, right, but lead gap is down to 2.8 seconds, so let's concentrate on Pro first. We know it's going to change, but when? This lap, possibly, 2.8 seconds starting it, and Rene Rast absolutely flying, and Dirk Werner has come so close. Mark VDS once again has had its best run, but this year it's just, I'm afraid, going to not be quite enough. But if you take away the ABS problem, if you claw back the time lost behind T uh, Tarsum back markers yesterday, so many ifs and buts. Well, unfortunately, ifs and buts don't get the job done. Uh, they can comfort themselves if that's what they feel they need to do. They've been absolutely at the front of this race all the way through. They've had a major problem with the sensor, which has had a bearing on the car's overall performance. But that car has been a, a car that has got pace on merit. Its lap time has matched anything else. It's only in the last few laps. As we see, Baz, is this a second run from Baz, or is he going over? What's he up to? Not sure. Is he off to Audi? I don't know what the heck he's doing. Curious. Strange. Yes. Strange. Well, might have been that he went to another of the BMW teams because there was the Royal Motorsport car, which is further up the road, and he may have been saying, um, please make sure you let us through. We've got a slender chance of winning this. There is the Royal car, the white car. Uh, there, Rene Rast all over the curve. Uh, GDL Mercedes that he almost tangled with a few hours ago, almost got tangled with again. That was a bit of a scare for Rene Rast. It yeah. shows the commitment. He didn't yeah, wait absolutely. at all. I mean, but also what it showed was the, the closing speed and the yeah. exit of Pujol was much, much greater. And Rene Rast had to sort of take slight avoiding action to be turning right rubble and letting the car come back naturally to the centre of the racetrack. And that is always, that's the biggest issue that's going to be between these two cars battling for the lead albeit 2.8 seconds the gap on the last lap and little moments like that just you can't control it you just have to make your judgment and, and if you make the right judgment fine if you make the wrong judgment well there's a penalty which would be uh, very tough at this stage of the race 18 minutes to go Now, number one, Rene Rast, is being warned about respecting the track limits at turn 17, and it's his second warning. So, if Rene Rast continues to run wide, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? I haven't a clue. Go on. In, in the remaining 18 and a half minutes, could he cop a drive through for track limits? Well, it's possible if he continues to run wide. Part of the reason he's running wide is because he's pushing so hard, of course, but uh, if he does get the lead, he can then afford to just reduce that pace a little bit. Well, I actually thought watching the car ride other parts of the circuit. Car one, car one must respect track limits, must respect track limits. Second warning, second warning. That's the voice of the race director. And that, is Adam. that coming out of Blanchemont? 17. Yeah. yeah, so the message is getting through to the drivers and they're in the garage. They see it on the timing screen as well as the two leading cars are absolutely nose to tail. Rene Rast in the Audi, on the back of Dirk Werner, he's got the better traction, he's got fresher tyres, but Dirk Werner is going to defend, they are absolutely together, but round the outside goes Rene Rast as they head to Brussel, the Royal BMW gets out of the way, Dirk Werner is going to fight for as long as he possibly can, and he hangs on to the race lead, Rene Rast will no doubt make a run heading down towards Pouan, and Dirk Werner runs him out wide, He's not going to give up without a fight with 17 minutes to go. This is defensive driving, but Rene Rast will have a go to the outside line at Pouan. Is it going to work there for him? Not in the first part, but he keeps on coming. Round the outside, round the outside, round the outside. He's going to get ahead, is he? On the run to Piff Path. Wide over the curb, they both go. Off the road goes Rene Rast. He has to slot back in behind and Dirk Werner slides under braking as they go into the Piff Path. He stays ahead. But Rene Rast is right on his tail, and Dirk Werner is doing what he's paid to do, and that is defend for all he is worth. And uh, that was fairly forceful defence, but I suppose under the circumstances, with the race in its closing moments, has justified, and Rene Rast just needs to think 
don't put yourself into jeopardy. Yes. You got close to it a couple of times. There was no way to go around the outside down of Brussels. You had to forget about it. Now, flashing his lights, trying to distract Jack like Brenner. Well, it, you know, I don't know why bother drivers bother doing it. A professional <laughs> driver is not going to be affected by it. No. Here they so come. The key here is that Rene Rast's momentum has been lost. He has had the benefit of running free air, oh no, a mistake from Werner in that bus stop chicane, watch for the Audi, good traction, a little bit more straight line speed, it's going to be another defence from the BMW on the run, down to the source, hanging to the right hand side of the track, coming down, they're going to watch Rennie Rast trying to break on the outside, get the slight advantage, no, but makes the cut back, gets up alongside and gets it through, and I mean, eventually it was going to happen. Audi leads the total 24 hours of Spa through into the lead, has got Rene Rast and Bas Linders, who's a proper racer, does at least acknowledge that. So with 15 minutes and change on the clock, the gamble has proved not to have worked. And OK, Audi may now get a clear run home. But Bas Linders watches on as Dirk Werner in second place, powers uphill. And now, does Dirk Werner slacken his pace and look after what's left of the tyres? Or does he keep pushing and try to force a mistake out of Rene Rast? Well, I think he might have to try very hard because there ain't any mistakes coming from Rene Rast. The mistake, if it ever comes, will be the consequence of somebody else rather than him. But I think now he is in the lead. There's nothing that uh, can be done by Dirk Werner to, to force an issue with the now leading RD and um, he's going to come home an honourable second. So downhill they are once more turning through the so-called speaker's corner down towards Pouin for the 521st time. And the gap as they went then through the uh, first sector uh, had Rene Rast ahead by a tenth, but he's going to be much more than that now as the gap continues to build. Let's hear from Bas Linders then. His car has slipped back into second position, but it's been a great effort. Baz, a great bit of driving from Dirk, nice and clean and good fun to watch. Yeah, okay, tried to close the door, um, good day, didn't touch, we didn't want uh, obviously that because uh, it's a long race and uh, well okay, it's uh, something big at stake, uh, I think it was a nice uh, little battle, but okay, like I said, uh, the Audi is a little bit quicker and uh, we will just try and follow, you see, see what happens, you never know, hey, still 14 minutes to go. Can you force him perhaps into a mistake? Well, I mean... Our strategy was maybe a little bit like that, yes, to, uh, because we knew we were not the fastest guy. So uh, we had to get them out of their shelves. And um, yeah, I think that's what we tried. But uh, I think uh, the number one will stay number one. Thank you very much. So Audi heading for another Spa 24-hour victory. Mark VDS, so near but yet so far. Well, I mean, I say a great effort by the Mark VDS team, in effect running on one engine with the other car eliminated through um, the touch of the wildlife getting into the, the cooling areas of that car. So they've had to fight off the might of Audi, and there's been Audi's strength, depth and strength all through the field, even bringing in their Le Mans winning driving partnership to assist you know, in that process. There's yeah. a little battle going on. We still have the number one respect track limits warning on the timing screen it's still only there as a second warning but it's not disappeared yet oh, it has now just as i say that so as you look at uh, now louis machiels who is leading pro-am still surprised they didn't run bertolini in the last stint but louis machiels is not slow not as quick as alexander sims and that gap coming down 22 seconds last time but actually in the sectors there's not much to choose between them no i mean there was 23 seconds about two laps ago and it's not really uh, significantly changed. I thought maybe Alexander Sims might be able to run yeah. the Ferrari down more quickly, but with 12, and there's, there's the BMW with Alexander Sims on board. Just wondering whether they left that on a set of old tyres to reduce the gap, and now he's struggling in the same way. It, it could Vandor, well be. I mean, we didn't get a view of that, mm. so that's speculation on our part, but whatever the reasons Alexander Sims comes past, gap down to 21.6 seconds, and uh, well, half a second quicker on that last lap to the BMW, but it's going to take a lot more than half a second of a lap. He needs to find really two seconds of that in these closing moments to put himself into a position to take first place in the Pro-Am category. And there is the car that runs in third, ahead of the car that's second, if you're with me, because it's on a different lap. But Craig Lowndes is going to bring home the Ferrari. Uh, so he's had a good long stint towards the end of the race, as we have then the uh, Audi there. Number two comes down towards the bus stop. 
And you've got Benoit Trellier here on the back of Adam Christodoulou. And the Bentley there as well is on a different lap, so ignore that. But ahead of it, Christodoulou and Trellier go through, fighting for 11th place. The gap is 0.2 of a second. Benoit Trellier goes to the outside line as they head into La Source. Can he find a way through? Not there, he can't, but the Audi right on the back of the Mercedes. And of course, it was these two drivers in these two cars that tangled early on this morning and really delayed the number two Audi with the damage. So there's not much love lost here. No, there's not. And Stephen Kane's getting the, the pound seat watching the, the driving of these two cars coming up over the hoo -hoo, uh, or up over the uh, radio, I should say, and then onto Camel Straight. And just watching and seeing, can the Audi get alongside? It yes, it can. Just about. Is it going to consolidate it? No, it's not. Interesting, isn't it? Adam Christodoulou in the Mercedes hangs on, but Trellier tries to cut across to the other side of the road. Can't do it there. Adam Christodoulou defends. Going back to his karting days here with the way that he's flicking the car around to defend. Over the curb goes Trellier. Is he going to get the run downhill? No, Christodoulou, good defensive driving there. Puts the car in the middle of the road. So you may have won Le Mans, Benoit, he says, but you're not getting past me without a fight. With just over ten and a half minutes to go, the Audi right on the back of the Mercedes heading downhill now. Yes, and this little kink corner with no name it used to be called. And then the run down to Pujo, but sufficiently far behind. He's just going to have to be patient and see what the Mercedes does in the Pujo corner. He's certainly quicker than the Mercedes in the mid part and certainly on the exit is catching. You can see the, the gap is closing, but not sufficiently again to be able to make a move either left or right to get alongside the Mercedes. Trailway now being warned about track limits as well as he shortens things a little bit there because he goes up onto the kerb and uh, accelerates his way on the tail of Christodoulou now coming down with the last 10 minutes of the race well and truly underway through campus making the run now up towards the end of for them lap 512 they are 11 laps down on the race leaders so two of them make their way up towards the completion of the lap but they are not done yet we're not done yet as a race there's still plenty of stuff to shake out of this as down towards the bus stop they go once more so Adam Christodoulou, all four wheels the wrong side of the white line there as they make their way up towards the bus stop for the final few laps of the race. And so as the cars turn their way right and then left up towards the timing line, Adam Christodoulou in the Mercedes then 11th. His last lap was a 2.26.6. He was only two tenths slower than Benoit Trellier there behind him in the number two Audi. The gap is 0.6 of a second. In actual fact, after all of that, uh, so Adam Christo has managed to pull away a bit from Benoit Trellier over the course of the lap, but by a bit, we're talking tenths here. Nine more minutes of the race remain then. As the leader is currently on lap 5.23. René Rast, you're on board with Benoit Trellier heading downhill. And behind is the Bentley number seven that is in a genuine position there in 13th. Trouble is, it's a lap down. So, uh, although it's on the same pace and it looks close, it's on a different lap and not therefore part of that battle. Up towards Le Com for lap 524 for the race leader. The battle you're looking at is on lap 513. Ahead, the surviving Boots and Junior McLaren. In fact, McLarens in general have had a pretty torrid time in the course of the race. ART losing both of its quick cars very early on. Lots of damage to others. And Benoit Trellier here is not going to get into the top ten. Tenth, incidentally, is Darren Turner. We've not really seen much of the MP Motorsport Aston in the last few hours, but it's gone solidly for fourth in class. Really frustrating that, because he's going to miss out on a podium finish. And I think I'm right in saying the surviving Aston, the Leonard car, is a long way down after its earlier uh, problems. And sadly, we lost the motor base of our racing team car in the early hours with Ahmad al Hafi's accident, which is a great, great shame after the car had gone so strongly. But Trellier, in the meantime, hunting down the Mercedes, and he's quicker through Pouin, uses the kerb, gets the second apex, carries the speed all the way down the hill, up onto the kerb, and now makes the run down towards the Piff Path then. That's the external view of it. Slightly different line being taken by the Audi, but look, he's right over the back of the Mercedes there. You'd think this was lap two, wouldn't you, virtually, rather than uh, lap 513 that they are on. The cars have driven through the night. They've had hard racing night and day and they are still tied together and this is why professional drivers stand out because Benoit Trellier who a couple of hours ago was up here in civvies talking to us back in his overalls back in the car back on the pace and doing what he's paid to do which is to go absolutely flat out and try and secure one more place it may only be 11th but he's still driving absolutely flat out out of Blanchimont now riding with the Audi heading down towards the bus stop once again hard on the brakes as they turn right and then left 
And up front, Rene Rast continues to lead the way. And look at the exit speed there. Better traction coming out of the corner, almost into the back of the Mercedes. Went Ben Trellier. So across the line, 0.296 of a second is all that separates these two as they come into La Source once again. And Trellier find a way past. Six and a half minutes to go. Marcus Winkelhock looks on. He's rather more concerned with car one than car two. Marcus, along with Rene Rast, won the Nürburgring 24 hours at the Nordschleife a couple of months ago. A month ago, indeed. And it's going to be another victory, seemingly, in a 24-hour race for the pair of them. So uphill once again goes this fight between Adam Christodoulou right up behind him, Benoit Trellier. And Stephen Kane now rather impudently buys into it. Now, uh, he's ahead on the track, but he's not ahead in the classification because he's a lap down on the Audi. But suddenly the Audi seems to lose touch, doesn't it, with the Mercedes and loses a place to the Bentley. What's all that about? Was that a mistake by Trellier somewhere or an instruction to back off? But that car suddenly seems to be going slowly down through Bruxelles. I think half a lap ago he was on the tail of the Mercedes. Mercedes is barely in shot, it's so far ahead now. So, if there were an instruction to back off, what has it achieved? So it must be that either there's a problem in the car or it's low on fuel. Can't believe it's low on fuel because 65 minute stints aren't normally a, a, a fuel problem. They're not uh, taking me to get marginal on fuel unless something else that we're not sure about. Anyway, the car slow. The other factor potentially is that not far behind it on the road is Audi number one. And there's the photo finish to consider here as well. And also, you never know, they might need to sacrifice number two just to sit between number one Audi and 77 BMW. So I think number two is being sacrificed from 11th place to go a lap down, possibly to sit behind number one and make the photo finish of the two Audis crossing the line together. That's one option. So Benoit Trellier, car sounds OK, but a lift certainly has delayed it and it works its way now through the left hander of Blanchiment. We've got four and a half minutes to go and it looks like it's going to be a win for Rene Rast, Laurence Vantour, who we've seen precious little of today in fairness, and Marcus Winkelhock. Laurence Vantour will I think be back in his overalls ready to get up to the podium, which is of course in the other pits, so the drivers have to make their way from these pits, the top pits, the F1 pits, all the way down to the old pits where the podium is in front of the fans and the grandstands. Over the line goes Number two, Benoit Trellier over the timing line. And as he comes through La Source, there is number one Audi, the leading car. And so the photo finish, if it is being orchestrated, shouldn't be that hard to do. Dirk Werner comes across the line in second place, five and a half seconds back. He is lapping slower still, but of course there is still traffic to factor into this as he gets the uh, lap there on 42, which is Gilles Vanillet, former GT3 European champion in the Ferrari. So it's going to be two more laps, I would suggest this, and one more before we get to the end of 24 hours of racing for the race leader, Rene Rast, in Audi number one, making his way up towards Le Con. But there is number two that goes through the shot first, and there is the leading car in sector one, a 40.7 plays against Dirk Werner's... Let's see what it is when he breaks the timing point, 41.2, so the gap continues to increase, but the BMW on older tyres is never going to be as quick. And unless Rene Rast has a problem, it's a win for Audi number one. Audi had victory here in 2011, when it was Greg Franchi, Timo Scheider and Matthias Ekstrom, the two DTM stars. In 2012, it was Rene Rast, Andrea Piccini and Frank Stippler. Mercedes last year, of course, but it looks like Audi is going to be back at the top. And the last BMW win, well, it's not going to be this year either, I know, but you've got to go back to 19... 98, Mark Due, Eric van der Poel and Alain Cudini in the World Championship Touring Car race that year when it was really not the strongest of events but uh, BMW's rather dominated here in the ETC and then the non-championship touring car years. So one more lap to run at the end of this looking at the clock as there is number two Audi, there's the one we're concerned with, number one inching up onto the back of the sister car, uh, expect to switch around for track position somewhere around the last lap of the race. So the Audis run by Belgian Audi Club Team WRT and there are as many good drivers that have an operational role within the team as there are actually behind the wheel of the car. Vincent Voss, uh, former racer of great success himself, Pierre Giudone, legend in uh, touring car and GT terms, former journalist and Pierre 
uh, won the race in touring cars and now of course is involved in that team as well as in uh, Orica still with Hugh de Schonac and you've also got Thierry Tassin who was a very quick single-seater racer and he himself had a touring car spell with Andy Rouse in the World Championship in 1987 so uh, those are just some of the brains trust and watching all of this from afar uh, is the man that normally engineers car number one, Adam Hardy, who's had to give up the chance of engineering what could turn out to be a 24-hour win because he's about to become a dad. And I suppose if you can't win a 24-hour race, being a dad ain't a bad compromise, is it, Adam? So uh, as his car goes on to its last lap now with Rene Rast at the wheel, it is in second place. Dirk Werner in the Mark VDS BMW and Christopher Meese in third place a lap down but it's going to be Audi 1-3-4 because you've got in fourth place the Edward Sandstrom, Greg Gilver and Stefan Ortelli, Santalock car. Good to see Santalock going the distance because that is a team that is getting better and better all the time. A few years ago it looked good but didn't really deliver. Uh, but uh, this season in Blancpain and in the Spa 24 hours, the car, the team, much, much more competitive. And it's good to see Santalock now starting to get up there with the established Audi teams teams themselves making their way now on to the pit wall the checkered flag is being made ready the AMG flags the Audi flags the Blancpain flags BMW flags mechanics up and down the pit lane hanging onto the debris fencing in front of us to cheer their cars home and for Bass Linders what a valiant effort Mark VDS Racing has put in the margin is going to be a modest one and number one Audi comes then out of Pouin They've still not done the switch, but it's about to happen, I think, isn't it? Because the two Audis, two and one, making their way through the piff path. And Rene Rast, in a moment, should be able to surge past the sister car. I'm assuming that's what the plan is. I'll be very surprised if they don't do it now with the cars so near the flag. And especially given that Trellier has sacrificed 11th place. They were nose to tail, and now he's ten and a half seconds back. So there must be a good reason for forcing the car to drop back out of the campus. Uh, right hand they come heading up towards Blanchimont for the last time and so it may not happen after all because the number two Audi is still going at a pace that doesn't suggest it's going to be able to be caught and passed with a corner to go by Rene Rast unless it completely dawdles through the bus stop is it going to let's see I think it is there's the switch so the photo is beautifully choreographed at the very last corner so number one, Rene Rast, Laurence Vantour and Marcus Finkelhock will win the total 24 hours of Spa as the car comes across the timing line. The chequered flag is waved right up against the pit wall to celebrate with the mechanics. Rast is victorious for the second time for his co-driver Marcus Finkelhock. It is a first victory and for Laurence Vantour, the Belgian driver, it is a first win. Second across the line, Dirk Werner, Lucas Lohr. Marcus Pantelow, that is Mar van der Straten saying next time we'll do it, we'll have a go next time, next time it'll be our year. And the cars come through La Source and make their way past the old pits. There's another checkered flag waved at the top of the hill there for the so-called ceremonial finish, but the clock has hit zero, the race is over. And then number three, heading for third place, Christopher Mies, Frank Stippler and James Nash, who in fairness has not really been given very much time in that car but it will come through for third place Pro-Am we've had the third no we haven't had the fourth place car home Darren Turner this is the Pro-Am winner which is going to be 53 the Ferrari in the hands of Louis Machiels Nick Homerson Andrea Bertolini and Marco Ciocci recovering from a very early puncture that cost it time so Ferrari wins in Pro-Am second in Pro-Am should be 79 Alexander Sims as the Mark VDS team celebrates a very fighting second place. Seven seconds was all that the margin was. Here comes Ikuriakos by Barwell Motorsport and the Blackpool-backed car of Alexander Sims. Alistair McKay, Andrew Smith, Oliver Bryant comes out of the bus stop. Second in Pro-Am is a mega result for what is a really uh, underfunded team. It does operate on a budget and Mark Lemmer and the Barwell guys have done a great job bringing that car home. And for third in the class, Craig Lowndes takes the Ferrari to the chequered flag in 52, shared with Andrea Piccini, Steve Wyatt and Michele Rugolo. What about Bentley? Uh, eight is home, 17th, seven. Stephen Kane is heading for 13th place. And the drivers now in the top three in each class go to the podium. The gentleman trophy is also yet to have the winner home and it's about to 51 Alexander Talkinitza is going to bring 51 over the timing line in this car that he shares with uh, Peter Mann, Francisco Guedes and Cedric Mezar 
comes up towards the timing line in a whole line of cars. Second is already home in that class as the winning Ferrari from AF Corsa comes across the line. Team Parker Racing taking uh, second with the car of Carl Rosenblatt, Leo Machitsky, Julian Westwood, Ian Loggy second in the Gentleman Trophy. Great result for Stuart Parker and his team that. And then third in the Gentleman Trophy, number 49, Yannick Malagol, Jean-Marc Bachelier, Howard Blanc and Francois Perodo. The marshals on the track with all the flags in time-honoured fashion to celebrate the cars completing the distance. And although teams can feel disappointed perhaps that they didn't get the result out of the race they wanted, just finishing in a 24-hour race is a massive achievement. And it's something that you can't take for granted, that's for sure. So the drivers complete the slowing down lap. The teams will be quickly heading in the case of the top three in each class down to the podium. And that's where we've sent Watty so that he can go and have a word with the winning drivers from certainly the Pro Cup at the end of a race that did have a sting in the tail, it kept us guessing on strategy right the way to the end. And Audi, it does everything properly, doesn't it, as a constructor, it gets the two cars there right at the very end for the photograph and on the slowing down lap. Well, Mark VDS BMW, even on that photograph, is going to be in the background. But it's not to say that it hasn't been a really valiant effort by Baz Linders and his guys. The marshals there, down at uh, campus, come out to celebrate the cars come home. The educational buildings are the buildings you can see in the background there. So let's confirm the way they came over the line. 527 laps of racing done. It's a win for Audi number one of Lawrence Van Tour, Marcus Winkelhock and René Rast. The head of the BMW from Mark VDS and Lucas Lord, Dirk Werner and Marcus Paltola. Christopher Mies, Frank Stippler, James Nash, third. Stefan Ortelli, Edward Sandstrom and Greg Gilbert, fifth. From the Maxis, Buk and Gertz with Jasmine Jafar, fifth. And Pro-Am winners, Nick Homerson, and Louis Machiels, Andrea Bertolini and Marco Ciocci come home sixth. Acuria Cost, 7th, AF Corsa, 8th, HTP Motorsport, 9th, MP Motorsport, cracking result for 10th ahead of the Black Falcon Mercedes and the third of the WRT uh, Audis from the Pro Cup, the Fatler Lotro Trellue car. This year's Le Mans winners, 12th after earlier delays during the course of the late morning here at Spa. So that is how the top 12 looks and the timing screen tells of uh, 40 cars that are still declared as running, but I suspect on classification uh, we'll lose a few more of those as well. 13th was where Bentley number 7 made it to the timing line, ahead of Mark Seng, Fabian Hamprecht and Philippe Salacada's Audi. Then you have Andrea Montermini, Francesco Castellacci, Stefano Guy and Andrea Rizzoli, who will have to go to the last round of the championship with the Pro-Am fight still raging in terms of points between them and Acuria Cost. That was a car that led early but had a long pit stop to have a new starter motor. 15th in the end that car and 24th Peter Mann, Alexander Talkinitza, Francisco Guedes and Cedric Mezard as the winners of the Gentleman Trophy. Miserable race for Nissans, blighted with punctures. 25th is number 80, Porsche. Martin Ragginger, winner of the event. 26th in the Pro-Am at Fach Auto Tech car ahead of the Second of the Gentleman Trophy cars, the Team Parker Racing Audi, there you can see in 28th. But by the time you get back to cars that are something like 43 laps down, you do start to get towards this problem of not having done enough laps to be classified as a finisher, with 75% being necessary. So that is how the result 25th to 36th looks after 527 laps of racing. And then after that, well, there are a limited number of cars still circulating at any meaningful pace at all, with the next car home being the uh, Leonard Motorsport Aston Martin, which is badly delayed, 35 Nissan badly delayed, and from 61 starters, we lost a good 20 cars, uh, even going to lunchtime today. But given all the destruction of last night, it's not been too bad a finishing record, I suppose. A few years ago when it was so wet, we were losing cars left, right and centre. So the drivers then come down a crowd in pit lane. There'll be some quick celebrations with the teams. The cars, of course, have to go into park fairway conditions if they're in the top three in each class. And photographers are there, the fans are there, the mechanics are all there. And this is only a fraction of the number of personnel that could be in that pit lane because, of course, some teams have long since departed, sad to say. One or two with the doors open, trying to get some heat into the cars. That's looking down from really near the race control building at Pit Inn. As there's the Pro-Am winning Ferrari down the pit lane, brought in by Louis Machiels. So 
So as the drivers then will in a moment, as I say, either go to Park Fermi and then back to the teams, or in some cases, the lucky cases, go to the podium. We'll have the three podium ceremonies. The uh, Pro Cup is the same as the overall, but with the Gentleman Trophy and Pro Am podiums to come after it as well. And we'll try and bring you those as rapidly as we can. But we want to hear from the winning drivers, of course, because what an effort by Rene Rast, Laurence Van Tour, and from Marcus Winkelhock, Rene Rast doing that Leviathan last stint, having to catch and pass, and they do it all over again when Mark VDS rolled the dice and kept the car on old tyres. So there is car number one finishing in position number one. It started from pole. You might think it was an easy run. Pole win, but a heck of a lot more went in between, didn't it, in 24 dramatic hours. The fastest lap of the race, just to clarify, Ben Schneider uh, in the Mercedes early this morning. And Ben Schneider may have only in the end been ninth, but he was still on it and came through to get the fastest lap of the race. So there is the number one Audi. It arrives at the Parc Ferme area down beneath the endurance podium. And in the moment, Rene Rast will hop out of the car. The Pirelli winner's hats are there ready and waiting. And Rene catches his breath. He's got to turn everything off. He's got to unplug himself and undo the belts and take the intercom out of his crash helmet. And the RACB officials are there to make sure that protocol is not breached. And there is one of the three winning drivers, Rene Ras, gets out of the car. Uh, he is understandably pretty weary, having been, yes, behind the wheel of a mighty machine for many hours now. But uh, we'll hear from Rene in a moment as he catches his breath, as he stretches his legs. He's been crammed into the car for the last couple of hours, two and a half hours or so. And very shortly, we'll take off the crash helmet, get some fresh air. Come and have a word with us, I'm sure, as Dirk Werner makes his way down the pit lane. Really valiant effort, seven seconds back after 24 hours of racing. What a great result. Rene Rast has taken off the crash helmet. He's with John Watson. Rene Rast, fantastic drive. I've never seen a drive so committed. You're exhausted. What do you, I mean, I, your emotions have none left. I'm completely exhausted. I mean, uh, I, I cannot find any words for that. Two wins or three wins for Audi, the biggest races in the world, Le Mans. Nürburgring and now Spa, and I was part of two of them. And today was a crazy race. The last uh, half an hour, I just pushed like hell. We had a great battle with uh, Dirk, and I think it was all fair, and uh, the team deserved it. They worked so hard for this win, and I'm just pleased to be part of that. Well, I mean, the BMW threw their joker on that last pit stop. They didn't change tires. When you got that information, you must have thought, oh no, I've got to do it all over again. Yeah, but I knew uh, the tires would just last uh, one stint, and uh, he tried to double stint them, and uh, I knew it wouldn't work out. And yeah, uh, this was the only chance they had, and yeah, it didn't pay off for them, but for us. And uh, Lawrence and uh, Marcus, they're not able to be down here, but what are your thoughts? They shared in this victory with you. They did a great job as well. I mean, it's a, it's a team effort for sure. Lawrence did a great, great start, great super pole. And uh, Marcus did also great stints in the night and in the day. So it was just a great team effort. Excellent. Well, congratulations, Rene. Dirk, fantastic drive. I mean, at the end of the day, the team had only one option. That was to give you the instruction not to change tyres, run another cent. But that was, you're never going to get the best out of the tyres after that. Yeah, that was quite difficult, I have to say, but the only chance really, as you said. And uh, yeah, great call from the team to try it. Um, you really have to say we didn't have the pace in the end to keep the Audi behind. We still tried it and I think it was nice to watch. Um, but yeah, it was quite difficult. Just You could see on the lap times we were just a little bit too slow in the end. And uh, thanks to the team anyways, uh, they did a great job this weekend. No mistakes and well, second now two times for me in, a in the last two occasions I've been here. So hopefully next time better. Okay, we were getting different messages, mixed messages from the pit lane. We understood there was a problem with the ABS and probably traction control. What was your problem with the car? Now the race is over and uh, it's all part of history. Yeah, the, uh, exactly. There, there was an electronic problem and uh, ABS and uh, traction control was affected. And then, yeah, you can imagine it's, uh, you, you know, it's difficult to fight against the car 
that has these two tools and uh, especially on the brakes uh, you have to be so much more careful um, to not destroy the tires and also on throttle you just lose massive time and uh, then especially on used tires compared to new tires that Rene had uh, on his Audi I was struggling quite a bit but uh, we tried and you know the, the team showed how brave they are and uh, I tried my best and second place, you know, it's, we didn't lose the race. We, we have a good second place. Well, I think the whole team did a brilliant job all weekend. I mean, it was such a difficult race, particularly the first six hours. We were really watching the emotions of the team through Baz Linder as your team principal. Yeah, I mean, everybody in the team uh, loves racing. And uh, it's a Belgium team. It's their, <laughs> it's their home race. And, you know, you can imagine they want to show the best of their abilities. And uh, of course, I, I think they are disappointed because they, they wanted, wanted to win. And Bas is a, is a true racer. Everybody in the team is a true racer. So, you know, we, we are quite happy to have finished the race on P2, but we are also sad not have won. Well, congratulations and enjoy it. It was a tough race. Well done. Thank you. So, Dirk Werner walks away from the car. Second place, seven seconds back. It really was a very, very impressive effort, that, given the fact that he was on old tyres and had that brake problem as well. So, uh, amazing stuff. And the other cars, you can see, still making their way down the pit road as well. We'll no doubt have an opportunity to hear from a representative of the third-placed team very shortly as well. So, Christopher Meese brought the car home. And we can, I think, catch up with uh, Christopher Meese now. He's just out of the car, and John has caught up with him as well. Congratulations, Christopher. Audi 1-3. I know you wanted to win the race, but you can't be unhappy with being in the podium. No, for sure not. I mean, after finishing two times on the podium the last two years, I mean, uh, yeah, our goal was to finish first. Our sister car did it. Uh, we, we had some, some small issues uh, in the night, so we lost a little bit um, because um, up to up to this point, we were we were leading our second, so it was always a hard fight between us and our sister car. But still, you know, after 24 hours, after this tough 24 hours, to be on the podium is very very good, and I'm very proud of my team. It was a crazy first six hours. I've never seen a race like it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, unbelievable. I I, I think uh, I don't know what happened, but you know, you have to be always careful, and you always have to keep in your mind that this is an endurance race for 24 hours and not a six-hour sprint race. Um, for sure, it's, it's always dangerous. Motorsport it can be dangerous, uh, we have seen that. Um, but luckily, and I hope that everybody is okay uh, after those incidents and accidents. So um, let's cross fingers that everybody is fine. Well, congratulations to you and to your co-drivers. Well done. Plenty of drama, plenty of talking points, and for the drivers that uh, didn't come home victorious. Time to go and have a shower, get the kit bag and go to the next race. Let's have a look at how the driver's classification is now. Lawrence Vantour uh, takes over the advantage within the Pro Cup ahead of Greg Gilver, Stefan Ortelli and Edward Sandstrom. And although they led at 12 hours in the championship, at the end of 24 hours, Stephen Kane, and Andy Merrick and Guy Smith slip down to third place within the Pro Cup, ahead of Gregoire de Moustier, Alvaro Parent, who didn't score, of course, had a miserable time in the McLaren, Harold Primat, Nico Verdonk, and then Christopher Mies, his third place here, helping him up the championship order. So Lawrence Van Tour, with a bit of help from his friends, comes home as the new leader of the Pro Cup in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series, with a bit of shuffling of driver combinations, that's why he's there on his own, and the cars then Back in the pit lane, one or two having to be pushed down the pit road there. That's the Leonard Motorsport AMR uh, Aston, Stuart Leonard's car. You can just see the black and yellow Aston at the top of the picture. So the drivers for the top three will make their way now uh, over to the podium. The good old traditional endurance pits podium it is. And as soon as everybody is there and rounded up and the trophies are there and the presenters are there, we can get things uh, underway. That is the F1 pits. That's where you find the uh, Formula 1 podium. But uh, for a race with this heritage, then it's the endurance podium and uh, grandstands that will be used. The first running of the event back in 1924 when uh, Henri Sprangel and Maurice Betgay were the winners. It's been on and off, of course, through world events. It ran as far as... Uh, 1934, had a break for a couple of years, came back, missed a year, missed a decade, and then had another few years away before the early 50s. But it's run really continuously since 1967. 
This is how Pro-Am looked after the 24 hours of Spa. Francesco Castellacci, Stefano Gai and Andrea Rizzoli lead, but there are 33 points on offer in the final race at the Nürburgring. So Oliver Bryant, Alistair McKay, Andrew Smith are still in touch. And so too Richard Abra, Joe Osborne and Mark Poole. Not a great result for Nick Katzberg and Henry Hassid, though Eugenio Amos tied on points from the Royal Motorsport BMW after a disappointing result for that car as well, in fairness. It only finished 35th, many, many laps down, 30. Uh, no, 41 laps indeed down on the leaders. So the Ferrari trio goes to the Nürburgring. The final race in September with an advantage of 14 points now in the championship over Oliver Bryant, Alistair McKaig and Andrew Smith, who's second place in Pro-Am for Barwell Motorsports and the Curia Cost has really been very good news for them indeed. So the... Drivers will be making their way up the steps of the podium very shortly. And with a chance to have a look back at some of the highlights of the race, there's an awful lot to remember. Of course, under the sunny skies, we started with the national flag being waved by Felix Baumgartner to get everybody away. And when the race did begin, it was Laurence Van Tour from pole position who accelerated away to snatch the advantage. Alessandro Pierguidi with him at the front of the grid. Daniel Zampieri was an early spinner. We had that bit of contact between Nick Katzberg and Stefan Mucha and early steering damage for Bentley number eight that therefore had to pit. Pierre Hershey was a spinner as well in number 38 Ferrari. Marco Ciocci had a punctured tyre. And then we had that car into the pit lane with bodywork to be repaired and a new tyre to be put on. As on track, Audi and Bentley went toe-to-toe -to -toe heading through Eau Rouge. Kevin S had to sort out a blown fuse on the McLaren. Captain Masaccio was nerfed into a spin by Martin Ragginger. And as the McLarens carved their way up the order, there were one or two concerned faces as the first round of pit stops unwound and Martin Ragginger had a spin in the Porsche. A safety car, and so although the car did come in behind the safety car, it had to come in again once the race was live once more. And that therefore cost the number three Audi two minutes. As night fell, the drivers pounded on into the darkness. The fans started to worry about important things like the discos and the nightlife and the beer, and more beer, and the barbecues that were lit, the fireworks overhead, and the drivers had to contend themselves with a long slog through the darkness. We lost the motor base Aston Martin during the night, and that was another badly damaged car and brought out the safety car. But thankfully, it looked as though the destruction had gone out of the race, and we didn't have too many more serious car-breaking dramas as Dawn arrived over Spa and the teams prepared themselves for the long slog to the chequered flag. During the night, the battle had very much established itself as being between the Mark VDS BMW, the surviving car because we'd lost 66 after it ingested a rabbit into the radiator, and the number one Audi. It was a seesaw battle. Whoever pitted lost the lead, but then when they had to start to factor in disc and pad changes, that started to open up different gaps. Other teams, though, were just concentrating on getting much-needed sleep. Rene Rast was on a charge, working his way up the inside of Nigel Farmer's Mercedes. They almost touched. Everybody wanted to record the action somehow, and Claude-Yves Gosselin head-butted the wall as he came out of Blanchiment. The car got to the pit lane, but the damage was too great, and the Frenchman was out of the race. There were more punctures for the Nissan team to cope with. Bob Neville's merry men set to work once again, and the Black Falcon, they had to try and put out a fire because their brake distance had even caught a line having come off the car. More punctures for the Drakkar Racing Ferrari team, and the pit stops continue to cycle through for Audi number one and BMW number 77. Harold Primat was ready to get on board the 84 Mercedes. As he did so, he then tangled with Michael Meadows, the Porsche specialist, getting caught up with him at the bus stop chicane. Audi 1 back on track, BMW 77 hunting it down. The battle between the two continued as we had the floor being repaired on Bentley number 7 and then slithering off the road just briefly on the Sport Garage Ferraris more problems for the number 18 Black Falcon Mercedes. Its teammate drove into the side of number two and caused damage and that delayed the Le Mans winners quite badly. And so by Sunday lunchtime it was clear it was going to be a battle between BMW and Audi. The BMW was developing an ABS problem and it didn't have the pace to be able to match that of the race now leading number one Audi that went charging past and although BMW felt it was going to win it was a win that got away. A spin for Stefano Comandini as down the pit road came number 77. 
ultimately Dirk Werner would take the car to the end of the race as it was going to be René Rast given the driving chores in number one. Rast got into the car, Fast Linders had a look down the pit lane to see what they were up against. Lucas Law had had to cope with a brake problem before giving the car to Marcus Paltela. And on the last pit stop, it was the full service, so to speak, for the Audi. But tyres were not changed on the BMW. Before that, though, there was the second pattern disc change on Audi number one, and that cost it another 30 seconds. It brought the BMW back into the hunt. And the Mark VDS mechanics were pretty pleased with life as they could sniff a victory just up the road. As Linders were still pretty confident that Rene Rast was absolutely flying and he went charging around the outside of Dirk Werner to pick up the race lead and that was a move that certainly Audi appreciated in the garage. Even Bas Linders, as a racer at heart, knew he'd just seen a good race move be pulled coming up the hill. On the last pit stop for number one, Rene Rast elected to stay in the car. At 77, it was just fuel, so they sent Dirk Van out into the lead of the race, but on old rubber. It was a bit tense in the Audi garage, but Rene Rast was absolutely charging. He took some big risks, he got through the traffic, and eventually he made his move on the outside at La Source. Wide in was tight out, and it meant that number one would come through to snaffle the race lead on the run down through La Source. Audi led with just minutes to go, and Bass Linders had to accept that they tried everything, but it just wasn't quite enough given the dramas for the BMW, and so Audi number one came through victorious. It was over the timing line. Rene Rast, Marcus Winkelhock, and Lawrence Vantor scored race victory by just seven seconds at the end of the total 24 hours of Spa. That's been another very good race indeed. And down in the pit lane, Rene Rast clambered out of the car as a race winner. And so, some of the fans making their way up the hill. And I think by now, most of the drivers would have been rounded up for the podium. And we've been joined up here by Ben Consenduras, who's had a very busy 24 hours down in the pit lane. There's been a lot going on, Ben. What a fantastic uh, sort of um, 24 hours experience Absolutely. as well. <laughs> You're tired. It, it's, it's another beautiful day. Uh, which will be Ian Loggy, Julian Westwood, Carl Rosenblatt and Leo Machitsky. And there they are, hiding behind the podium. Pirelli caps on, out they come, as Leo Machitsky, the Russian driver, on loan from Barwell for the weekend. Julian Westwood, Carl Rosenblatt and Ian Loggy, the man who pays the bills, really. And he there on the podium at Spa for his first experience of the 24 hours. And then the class winners are going to make their way out onto the podium for AF Corsa, Peter Mann, Alexander Talkinitsa Sr, Francisco Guedes and Cedric Meza, the Ferrari drivers for AF Corsa. And so, as the drivers are there, then we shall have the national anthem of the winning team. An AF Corsa win in the Gentleman Trophy. The winners in the Gentleman Trophy at the 24 hours of Spa. Alexander Talkinitsa, Peter Mann, Francisco Guedes and Cedric Mezar. The trophies, though, first of all, are presented to the third-place drivers.